That was slightly compressed, wouldn't you agree? Oh, all right. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Starting off this episode on a metal note. <laughs> Woo! Yes. Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Dr. Shadow, the Internet Personality of the West End. Welcome to Live and Wired, the internet show about a bunch of people sitting at home talking about movies and video games and stuff. And that's yes, it. and uh, the stuff is where we focus on the most. Yeah. And, and also, on the stuff. you might be noticing there is another person sat at home on the internet talking about movies and video games and stuff. And that person you might have known from some other stuff that they've done involving movies. They've done stuff in movies. That's true. For yeah. the record, John, yes. It's That's always crazy. like this when I have a conversation <laughs> with them, or anyone else for that matter. Well, listen, I'm really I'm really thrilled to be a guest uh, on your show, Decker and Creepy and Patricia. And uh, I, I just have, uh, there's one thing I've been dying to ask or dying to talk about. Uh, last summer, you, uh, Decker, you went for, you walked 16 miles to see uh, Alien Covenant, right? Oh uh, yeah, that that's the thing or, about living in a small town with no car. <laughs> right, right. And and when I when I heard that, I was so impressed. I said, "That's hardcore. That's the kind of guy I would want, like on my team, to do like just about anything." I mean, if you're willing for, for what you do, for what your dream was, walk 16 miles. And for people who are here in uh, the LA County area, that's like walking from the more northernest part of Hollywood, like where the Hollywood sign is all the way to Santa Monica. Try to walk that, driving that distance is tough. Trying to cross streets and get, you know, of course you'd be driving through uh, traffic. That is serious. That is, what did it take you? Like four hours, three hours, five uh, about hours? About four, I'm trying to, it, 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 I, uh, I was like on Instagram the whole time, right. like complaining. <laughs> uh -huh. Documenting your travails. And then you got to ride back, right? Uh, I got a ride back, which was. And then, and then you did the review. The reaction review, right? Yeah. Well, congratulations. There's not many people who would do that. They would have waited and waited, but you wanted to see it on the first night. And that was like really, that so impressed me. That sounds like something that uh, there's the people that I know that are very successful at what they do, they would do that. And that would be one of their stories. Like, you know, when they get their big cable TV show and stuff like that, says, well, listen, I, I, it wasn't easy. I wanted to make sure on the first day that, uh, that uh, Alien Covenant was released, I had a review out, and it didn't matter that I didn't have a ride, I was gonna be there, that's a big deal. So pat yourself on the back, and you two, the rest of you two, pat him on the back too. Uh, Nick Glevosek just says, I'm broken a dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't that, Boy, isn't, that, isn't that lovely? And the fan without a face says, Alien Covenant was boring. Decker, you wasted a trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he can't help that. He doesn't make them, he just reviews them. Hey, listen, if you're that impressed, wait until Decker tells you some of the stories about our trip to Japan, because there was a lot, a <laughs> lot of walking involved. Uh, I, I remember like us being on, on the uh, on the Shinkansen, and all that. we got no place to sleep, but we got the rail pass so we can go anywhere free, you know, just anywhere the train can take you, just kind of keep going as long as it's the same company, which is a company that owns... Uh, tracks all across Japan and uh, just like I'm, I'm sitting there just trying to make a best of a bad situation like hey this is like we're hobos with superpowers <laughs> and, and creepy's just like now now was that when you got your 50,000 uh, that was at YouTube you went to YouTube uh, yeah that, that's something you do with YouTube getting yeah, your 50, that was, uh, I, I, we didn't have that what how, that was like uh at that point, how many subscribers did the channel have? Something a little over twenty, a little little under twenty thousand. Mm -hmm. I think it had. Yeah, it was. It was. It was lower than uh, fifty thousand. I was thinking that it was, but no, it was lower than that. And like, um, uh, yeah, you had ju you had just recently, I think, cleared twenty thousand, and you were, and. Uh, I, it, it's kind of hard for me to remember because by that point, Decker had stopped calling me in the middle of the night to brag about how many subscribers he had now. <laughs> right. <laughs> because by the he way, used just hit eighty-six thousand. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, at least it's at least it's at a semi-reasonable hour, and I'm not asleep yet. I am awake for this. But and uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you've covered. Uh, you've seen other YouTubers once they break that hundred thousand k. Like, uh, what's that uh, that guy? Uh, he's in England. Lancaster, England. It's called. It's spelled Thoughty Two, 
but it's pronounced 42 and he does like just random facts when he broke a thousand well excuse me when he broke a hundred thousand boom he just everything shot up after that so i think mm -hmm. you know that that uh, i would be prepared for mm -hmm. a, a big a growth spurt once you approach and pass a hundred in my See, opinion i gotta i gotta just remember to ground myself and hold myself to a high standard because what i exactly. found i was talking about it on the gaming channel uh, last night during a stream where i was like I, I have the same problems I always had. It's just now people are letting me get away with it more often. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. So you, like, you gotta like, you gotta self-regulate when you have uh, the fame kind of creeping in. Well, you just yeah. never lower your you don't you don't want to lower your standards. You don't want to say, oh well, I've reached this point. Uh, my listeners can accept less. No, I, I think that's when you start pouring it on. That's when it gets. I mean, we anyone have standards. On, What's that? Decker, did you Toby know about Kirby, this? Toby Kirby just did a two pound super chat saying, Decker Car Fund, here's your first wheel nuts. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is, is so hilarious. nice. Thank you so much, Toby Kirby. Yes, that is appreciated. Uh, also, I'm wondering if we should actually get into the topics. At some, oh, we're already at 113 viewers. Awesome. All right. Is that good? Great. Okay. I, the first what? episode broke around 200 viewers at once, which was. Uh -huh. Pretty nice, but usually this is a little slower to get to the hundred. Mm -hmm. And last uh, episode three kind of broke a hundred for a little bit, and then was hovering around eighty and ninety for most of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know mm -hmm. it's it is what it is. I, like I said, live and wired. It kind of yeah. The the channel's got eighty six thousand subscribers, but live and wired's a new show on it. It's got to build its own fan base. So right. I'm happy with where it, where it is and what it's doing already. So. Yeah. It, Tell me, I'll tell go ahead and say it. You know, it's like we also have a very famous guest here today. And well, as many of your trolls, Decker, have told me, leeching off another person's popularity does help. Oh, well, yes. You know what's funny is I, I, I feel like I'm the one leeching off of Decker. He's yes, the, uh, just so he's you know. The one with all John, the followers. John Masari. Masari. Mas yeah, gotta, and you have to do that hand them. movement. You have to do that. At, at, you know, he has his own YouTube channel, and you can check it out in the uh, a link in the description. Yeah. And I'll try and remember to add a card at the end of this video after it's done processing. Mm -hmm. And you can check out lots of his work there, like music for a ragu commercial. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, got, you, gotta, you, you, you always wondered bills. why that sauce was so delicious. <laughs> yeah. That's it, right there. <laughs> The Masari. Masari factor. The Masari factor. You know, my, you know my, what's my, funny my, is that I was Masari. going over my YouTube channel with uh, with a uh, with a social media person, and I said, you know, do I, you know, how about if I mix music with making spaghetti because that's one one of the things that have got, has gotten the most views. Um, but let me let, let me ask you, Decker, ask your permission. Is at what you just tell me at what point it's okay to do like some shout outs to some people because there are. There's going to be people watching this now and then afterwards that would appreciate me saying saying hi. So I don't. I don't I've never done well, shout outs. I <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know if you ever. Uh, it, whenever it's appropriate, it's your show. At least I don't think I've done shout outs. Uh, how well, about now? Thinking, and then you could do okay. it again, like when we sign okay. off. You could do well, it at the beginning and at sure, the end. Sure. Well, it's very simple. Uh, first of all, first and foremost, to the Kyoto brothers, which is, by the way, it's pronounced Kyoto. Um, I, and, I, I, uh, I'm famous for my mispronunciations. That's okay. That's okay. The, you know what? What's good about your mispronunciations is that they're interesting mispronunciations. <laughs> they're not like totally awful. They're like, oh, okay, that, that's funny. It's like when and you it, pronounce, first with pronounce the, my the Jurassic name. World review, the whole quiz Pratt joke was because when right. I was working with Cody and we were working on the script together, I kept right. mispronouncing Pratt. <laughs> huh. Okay, so here it goes. It's to the Kyoto brothers. That would be Stephen. Edward and Charlie Kyoto for being so brilliant as to conceive this bacchanalia of insanity, which is known as killer clowns from outer space. I mean, it was basically from their mind. They, they'll they tell you very simply, it was a movie that they wanted to make. It was a movie that they would want to see when they were kids. Something really crazy, something really fun with special effects, something that was funny, could be scary. And, and they achieved that. And, and when I... Um, was asked along with like 50 other composers to audition with that for that movie. When I saw that movie, I went to the screening with no music, barely any sound effects. I was, actually, it's, it's very terrifying with no sound effects. I just, it was like, I, I took, you know, you know, like Babe Ruth, you know, when he pointed the bat out to, uh, you know, uh, the far, uh, the, 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 the far seats and hit the t home run, 
that's why that's how I felt. I said, no, this is my movie. I have to do this. And there's a lot of I won't mention who, but there were a lot of other big names at, at the time and now that wanted to do that movie because it was so bizarre and interesting. Um, so uh, props to the Kyoto brothers for, for doing that. Then uh, then if that wasn't enough, we've got a great song opening up the uh, the movie that defines the movie. Uh, 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 record uh, performed written by the dickies who are still valid still touring still uh, relevant they're they're, they're going to be in china pretty soon i think in in march um they're always on tour they're always playing they're always working they're always creating new music uh i want to say hi to stan lee and leonard phillips and um also um they for this new album that's coming out they recorded a new version of the killer clowns theme song that's absolutely awesome that that's all i can say it has more and different instruments in it it's a really great play kind of like you know i decided to take my killer clown march and re-realize it and then do the other music all the underscore music with an orchestra they they really just they just really nailed it it's just they're, they're such great musicians um the other guys i want to say are friends of mine uh bear mccreary hi bear John Debney, uh, Bear McCreary, you know who Bear McCreary is, right? I'm pretty of sure most, yeah, he did, uh, most people Outland. watching know who Bear McCreary is. <laughs> yeah, he you know, did the music for Walking Dead. Currently, he's doing the music for the new God of War game. Does the music for Outlander, where his wife actually sings the theme song. So, yeah, I'm familiar with him. Dabby, get off my taxes. <laughs> those are my taxes. I, I, need, I paid those. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, I'm actually curious about the Kyoto I, I Brothers. John when, when looks like were, he froze. Uh, uh. Um, I'm actually curious about the Kyoto Brothers. Now, it's kind of funny when looking back on the Killer Clowns from Outer Space movie and then looking um, back a few years prior with Pee-wee's Big Adventure and about, like, the large Marge and the scene with the dinosaurs and the creepy clown dream. I wonder if they were, like, getting that inspiration. Just like, yeah, let's just take that and make it scarier. <laughs> Yeah, it does seem like that could have been the case. Like even Pee Wee Herman, had, you know, the Pee Wee Herman movie had its had some freaky moments to it. I I remember the scene that actually scared me as a kid was the one with the woman who was the ghost trucker. Yeah, Large Marge. Yeah. 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 That was and okay. You said Large Marge, and it did Yeah, and it didn't click, but it does it. now. Yeah. We got a ten dollars super chat from Andrew Clan saying. Decker car fun so he doesn't spend the rest of this winter tied to this fucking couch. <laughs> <laughs> I sent Another point. Um, Decker has no indoor voice. He froze. <laughs> okay, now I see his face like just his icon. I don't know if he's reconnecting now or well, things are happening. That's better than just being frozen. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, anyway. uh, shall we get started on some news? Well, uh, one of the things uh, I wanted to talk about was the fact that there's the Killer Clowns orchestral concert live thing. I wanted to ask John about exactly what it is because it seems like to me that it's they're playing the movie and the movie's playing no music, but they have a live orchestra there with John Masari, who <laughs> is conducting the music for the movie as it happens. Mm -hmm. And I wanted confirmation on that, and now I'm just looking at John's little icon there, and I'm like, <laughs> "Oh, is that a message from John? We might, we might be getting." Uh -oh. I'll be back in a second. Something happened here. I'm gonna be up and running in a second. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right, he's fine. Yeah, I he's just fine. thought he got put in a balloon. Yeah. Just. Uh huh. Yeah, that's uh, okay. Well, uh, while we wait for him, I guess we can like quickly discuss about some other news Nickel topics. Rick says, Holy fucking shit! How hasn't my senpai noticed? And yet, Decker, call me fucking out. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's quite something. So, looks like you got yourself a massive fan there, Decker. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. So lots and lots of. Lots of news, and all oh, of it yeah. involves, all, almost all of it, involves nostalgia of one way or another. Yes, uh, courtesy of the Super Bowl. So thank you so much, Super Bowl, for releasing all those trailers and all this news information. But yeah, I mean, I don't even know where we're going to start with because there's a lot of things that were revealed. 
So it was like literally one day after the last episode of Live and Wired. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Like one day later, we got so much stuff thanks to the Super Bowl and, uh, of course, other um, news um, medias with discussing about um, other movies and TV shows and video games. Uh, this one actually would be a really interesting one to start out with because I actually saw this one first. So. Uh, we're getting some new TV series based off of some movies. One of them is uh, Conan the Barbarian. We're getting a Conan the Barbarian TV adaptation from Amazon Prime. I'm actually kind of excited about this because I remember the... I mean, Conan and television has not necessarily had an easy relationship with each other. There was the... Uh, I mean, like every when you say Conan, people remember the uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger movies from the early '80s. They remember uh, the remo the reboot that came. Uh, what was it? Uh, it was it was several years ago, but yeah, yeah, wasn't that the one with um, the same guy from it? Game of Thrones? Yeah, yeah, that's him. Yeah, the same guy from Game of Thrones, and now he's going to be Aquaman. Right, and he. Uh, I still have to watch that Conan. Oh, I also have to watch the Crawl the Conqueror movie, which was supposed supposed to be the third in the conan series right but uh i did uh, and i have seen that movie i love that movie actually but um uh, there was the cartoon shows the that aired in the 80s and then of course there was the series that aired on upn that everyone tries to pretend never really happened and john mas mas masari, masari. <laughs> Yeah, yes. awesome. welcome back. Yes, uh, don't ask me how that happened. We've been having a little brownouts here in the uh, jewel city of Glendale, uh, mm. which is right on the other side of the Hollywood sign. Sorry to interrupt. Oh. Sorry, to in no, it's okay. I don't want to stop your tra train of thought. Thought you were talking about uh, Conan. Our train of thought. Just, Dobby came <laughs> over and was messing with my taxes. I picked him up, put him down. Then I noticed you were just kind of frozen in time. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I was I'm like. Really I, I will. I just want to say it's Bear McCreary's birthday, and oh. Bear Bear played on my new soundtrack album. He played the Hurdy Gurdy, and he also played the accordion. He plays on a number of tracks. So uh, we we've, we've known each other for a number of years, and it was really awesome that he agreed to uh, play on the soundtrack album. So the soundtrack album that's coming out in May, he's playing on it. So let's go on. Let's talk about Conan. Yes. Well, actually, I was something I wanted to ask you about the live concert Killer Clowns event oh, yeah. happening in May, I think it is, yes. May 19th. Yeah, May 19th. And I, as far as I could tell from what was going on, it's like I'm, I'm you know, just clicking through things real quick and trying to get an idea. But I'm like, okay, is it the movie is playing with no music and you are there with a live orchestra conducting the soundtrack as the movie plays? <laughs> you got that, that right on the nose. I'll be, be using this conductor's baton right here. This oh, exact awesome. one. This is my. This is a customized. I learn how to pronounce every word now. <laughs> this is a customized uh, uh, conductor's baton. It's just. It, it's a custom made. It was uh, made in Japan by a. Uh, uh, it's actually made by someone who makes knives and swords for me. It's per per perfectly balanced for my hand. And they also uh, make knives and swords for you. Uh, we can't talk about that right now. Well, we'll talk about it in another right, California. But anyways, yes, that's exactly what's going to happen. There's going to be there is a um, the screen will be above the orchestra. There'll be an orchestra in front of me, uh, approximately forty people. The Dickies will be will be sharing the orchestra the, the stage with the Dickies. They'll be off to the side, and uh, that's what it's going to be like. And we we're going to have slideshows of people with body art. You know, there's tons of people all over the world that have great killer clown from outer space outer space body art there's gonna be those people that do uh, uh fan art of all sorts uh crafts uh everything from models to masks to uh posters and pictures and paintings and renderings we're gonna have slideshows of all this stuff because it's the reason why this you may ask why am i doing this crazy idea is because this movie is so loved by a very core um lovely group of people all over the world and it's been so good to me that uh, this is something that I wanted to do for a long time. And not only because the, the synthesizer score was, um, even though it was a synthesizer score, we could have done it with an orchestra, believe it or not, back in the day. But the Kyoto Brothers wanted such a unique color uh, and coloration to uh, the film. They just said, you know, get whatever, you know, synthesizer, musical instruments, just create something different. And so that was a big challenge. And that was a, 
ton of fun to do. I got to use all my uh, gear that now is considered all vintage and everything, but I got to use that. And um, but it was all the music is conceived from a classical standpoint. So that's what kind of makes it work. It's, there's this contrast of classical music played with all these colorful electronic instruments of the day. And um, and the Kyoto brothers were very happy with it. You know, they're very happy about it. That's another thing. Working with those guys, it was like living down this. It was like, it was like making model airplanes with the guys that live down the streets. You know, you make some model airplanes and go to a field and blow them up. <laughs> you know, we have a five dollar the- question from James Colin who says, "Yeah, uh, what do you think of movies like Reign of Fire and Dragonheart, and any plans uh-huh. to review it?" Uh, I've seen Dragonheart. Reign of Fire, I think, wasn't that the one where they had dragons in a sort of more modern setting? So yes. it's like guns versus dragons? More like uh, helicopters I, I versus dragons. I heard that that was yeah. a terrible movie when it came out, but I never actually saw it, and I've, it's always intrigued me. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's that kind of works on the whole contrast thing, like John was talking about. It's like the contrasting orchestral techniques with a synthesizer, mm-hmm. and that kind of is all throughout uh, the killer clowns. You got yeah. the contrast of, you know, uh, the classic contrast of it's a clown, it's happy and fun, it murders you. Yeah. <laughs> but even further contrast, like it's a uh, small town America science fiction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, Lebl- like The Blob. I don't know if you guys ever saw The Blob. I was, I was going to compare it to a classic yeah. 50s horror slash sci-fi movie where it's a small, unassuming yeah. town, like usually right. out in the Midwest, and right. then an alien spaceship crash lands and all hell breaks loose. Right, right. And also, the another. I don't know if it's like an intentional contrast, but it's just like you have the horrifying situation. It's, you know, people are dying. People are being kidnapped. It's not good. And mm-hmm. then you've got the character of Mike Tobacco and the way oh, he's yeah. acted, and it just—he could be selling chewing gum yes. on a TV. <laughs> right, right. And and, and he, he, he's like there. perfect for a double mint commercial. <laughs> and he's running from clowns that are trying to kill him with popcorn guns. It's just all right. of the contrasts that they help accentuate all of the parts. So that's kind of with Reign of Fire, where I'm thinking like it's all dark and gritty and the dragons are dark and gritty and the guns are dark and gritty, but it's the dragons and guns aspect. There is a contrast there and it does intrigue me. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, all the characters that appear in Kill Clowns from Outer Space, everything from the police officer to the, 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 the boyfriend and girlfriend and, and the, the straight guy police officer, the straight man, the, the, you know, it all comes from the Kyoto brothers group of friends that they grew up with. They basically take took every one of their friends and put a caricature caricature of them in the movie. Even the lines when off there's a line where um, John Vernon says, "Well, whoop the goddamn to do right," and and that's like there, there was someone like like a woodshop teacher that used to say that all the time. You know, one of the Kyoto brothers says, "We got to put that line in because that used to be you know." So it's a very um, uh, it's a very organic uh, sort of uh, effort creation. It, n- nothing was done by accident in that movie as crazy and as bizarre and goofy as the concept is i found that a lot of movies that are like that you know that have that flavor to them but Mm -hmm. are also lifted from like the director's or the screenwriter's personal experiences Mm -hmm. that tends to resonate with people in a Mm -hmm. in a very unusual way but in a meaningful way too it will stick with people i mean like to use a non-sci-fi horror example you have the movie stand by me which feels Mm -hmm. like everybody's childhood at some point or another they feel like was a little bit of that movie was in there right. and so like with killer clown like assuming you know for a moment we take out the sci-fi horror aspect of mm-hmm. alien murderous clowns and you know but like why would take you that away to take that away well what Pre- i'm getting at is is like remove that element for a moment and there are a lot of things in the movie that feel like stuff that would happen to you in real life Mm -hmm. perhaps if you were having a very unusual night or it had too much to drink or had licked the wrong stamp but even still (laughs) you there is that element of nostalgia and of just ordinary life when it gets weird right and and it, a couple well, of we have a ten dollar question from we have a ten dollar and one cent question from Prime Minister <laughs> Green Team, who says, "Decker, are you familiar with Warhammer 40k? If so, you should review the Ultramarines movie. Love the videos. Keep up the great work." Uh, yeah, Warhammer 40,000. I used to actually have a little set of Tyranids, 
I had a lot of trouble with uh, the one legendary piece I had, Old One Eye. His his limbs were so heavy, the super glue couldn't hold the pewter together. They kept falling off. I kept calling him Old One Arm. But uh, <laughs> I'm familiar with Warhammer Forty Thousand, which is it's you know, Warhammer is sort of a fantasy medieval miniature war game, and Warhammer Forty Thousand does the contrast and sets it in the year 40,000 and therefore everything is super sci-fi, but you still have orcs and all kinds of weird stuff. And you bring in the aliens and you bring in the dark elves and alien dark elves. <laughs> and also Toby Kirby dropped uh, two pounds for a second wheel nut. <laughs> <laughs> and awesome. yeah, reviewing a 40,000 movie would be interesting. Yeah. It's, it's 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 Warhammer Forty Thousand has just been a part of so many uh, games, like video games and stuff, for so long. I remember seeing all kinds of things about Gene Stealers way before I knew anything about Warhammer or Warhammer Forty Thousand, and all kinds of stuff. There's just so much lore that's been built up over the decades, and it's still going strong. Mm. Ah, but yeah. Speaking of so, uh, yes, speaking of games with a lot of lore that's still going strong, there's uh, more news about the uh, development of Metroid Prime Four. Yes, so this has been going on rumors for a very long time, discussing about the Metroid Prime series because a lot of people thought, oh, um, you know, there's going to be a Metroid Prime Four because we did see it in last year's E3. They did reveal that there was going to be a Metroid Prime Four, but nobody knew who the developer was. Then there was some rumors going around saying that it was actually being developed by Bandai Namco, and now as of this week, we have gotten the confirmation that it has. Uh, Metroid Prime 4 is being developed by Bandai Namco Singapore. It is not being developed by Retro Studios. Uh, I've heard some things uh, slightly more recently with... Uh, I, I, I think. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I heard some stuff about maybe Bandai Namco Singapore worked on like the groundwork and the engine, and then it's going to Bandai Namco Japan? Possibly, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. But right. yeah, um, I think I do remember that some people were a little bit disappointed with not being going over to Retro Studios. But then again, um, Bandai Namco has been doing well with Nintendo lately. They they did the recent Super Smash Brothers game and they did Pokémon Tournament. So those games were deemed very decently. So I would like to see their take on Metroid. And uh, awesome. since I'm, I'm covering the music end here, I'm, I'm going to be sending you guys a link to some of uh, Kinji Yamamoto's uh, music for uh, Metroid oh. uh, uh, and SoundCloud. I, I, I don't know if you can, I don't know how it will come up, but it's, uh, it's from, it looks like it's from a fan. Uh, I can't find his discreet SoundCloud page. He, he might be on uh, Reverb Nation or something else, but I'm, I'll send it to um, Patricia. Thank you. Sure. Uh, oh, we got a $50 comment from V, who says, this is just because I'm a big fan of Decker and Creepy and enjoy their content. Thank you. I mean, what? really, that's, I don't know what to say. I, I Sorry for being so simplistic, but thank you. <laughs> also, just now, Alexa Mitchell dropped $2. No comment. They're just like, <laughs> I, 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 okay, is it 50 Okay, here, just... Yeah. Thank you also. <laughs> Thank you. Alexa. Thank you very much. Yes. Domo arigato. Oh yeah, Domo the arigato. Metroid Metroid series has always had some really really good uh, musical notes to go with it because mm -hmm. it, it's also a combination of science fiction and horror because it's inspired by the Alien series quite clearly. Mm -hmm. Yes. The um the creator cites the uh well she cite the, the creator cited um Ripley specifically as the the inspiration for Samus Aran, and it was uh, it was very much intended originally to be this big. I still online. Yeah, yeah, you're still you're still here. Okay, okay, I both of you. I'm, I apologize for interrupting like that. I just I uh, everyone froze. Everyone froze, and I was yeah. worried. Okay, am I? If I even <laughs> is it my turn now to get I can get see knocked you. off? <laughs> All the Johns must go. <laughs> All the Johns, <laughs> All the Johns must go. Oh, that go. sounds disastrous. Yeah. No, I, I see creepy. Okay, so we got another two pound um, comment from Toby Kirby who says, V got the rest of the nuts. Now I have no purpose. <laughs> <laughs> 
Don't worry. I'm sure that you can contribute something, Toby. Oh. Uh, you can contribute to the, um, well, I mean, you got the nuts. We need bolts. We need bolts to hold the nuts together. That's true. That's true. But uh, yes, uh, Metroid. I mean, I've I've been a. I I remember playing the crap out of the first Metroid, though I never beat the first one like in its original form. The remaster of the first Metroid for Game Boy Advance, I did complete Metroid Zero Mission. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I actually defeated the first Metroid game when I was in high school, but I mostly played through Zero Mission. And uh, for those who actually saw my live stream play of all um, the uh, the handheld Metroid games and Super Metroid, I did mention that it was my favorite game of all time. And when I was live streaming through another Metroid 2 remake, I actually had Dr. M64 uh, as a guest for a little bit. And we talked a little bit about the development of, um, you know, his 10-year dedication to working on another Metroid 2 remake. Mm -hmm. um, we have course. a five dollar um, comment from uh, Cthulhu Chow, who says it's not much, but I hope it helps. Trust me, every little bit helps. Thank you so much. It does. Oh, yeah, you. but things are also looking up quite a bit on the channel in general, which is very, very nice. After after twenty seventeen, <laughs> any news is good. Any good news feels like wonderful. And twenty eighteen has been doing really good so far. Well, I, have, I have a question about your your reviews in general, uh, Decker. You said you're just going to constantly call your reviews the summer of, if you do a series of, of films, let's say if you did all Quentin Tarantino movies, you're just going to say it's the summer of Quentin Tarantino, even if it's winter. Well, the, the, the problem with the summer of Arnold Schwarzenegger was... It went into December. <laughs> everything was start, starting to slow down. Everything It was so right. much that just got... Everything went behind and behind. Like I was talking to you when I was talking about doing the March of the Clowns and talking right. a little bit about Killer Clown stuff then. And then things got delayed for a few weeks yeah. and that didn't exactly land on March as well. And then Hurricane Harvey hit. And then I, I think I also got really sick. I got an abscess tooth. I got a lot of dental work done. So many things just dropped. I'm still two months behind, pretty much. I'm still doing <laughs> the reviews yeah. right now that I'm doing the Phantasm series. That was supposed to be done November 2017. That's when I scheduled it. Mm -hmm. do you, do you do uh, so, the, so, so Arnold Schwarzenegger, not only was it supposed to be the summer special scheduled all within weeks that were actually in the summer, but that was also when the hurricanes hit and as things got stretched out and there would be two or three weeks that would go by before I'd even get another review out. So I was losing time fast and everything was stretching out. And then it was well into uh, September I think uh, October, no. I think it was November. Yeah, it was. It was November that I was still calling it the summer. And did you? Uh, we, your have own five, we have a five dollar comment from James Colin who says, "Any plans on doing uh, Ray Harryhausen films? That would be a great summer." Oh wow, that's great. Great. oh yeah. Mm. Not this year. Oh, I got. Summer. I got plans this year. Oh, that would oh, be summer, that would be a great yeah, series. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's actually going to land on summer. I hope to catch up, or I might just do what my fiance and everyone who is sane around me is telling, <laughs> and actually say, you know what? I uh, want a week from here on out. I'm sorry about the eight or so we're also supposed to have by now, but I need to live. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, but you know, you can have that as a as a as a goal at some point because that would be a great retrospect and you know if you if you do all those ray harry ray harryhausen visual effects movies you'll be able to see all the comparisons of what uh, of all the influences that he has had on uh, filmmakers today mm -hmm. and um, i did a documentary uh and i actually got to meet ray harryhausen before he Ooh, passed awesome. away i was working at a place called spark hill that we did a retrospective on his life and everyone came in to say hi to him and, and to sit there and talk with him. We're talking about, uh, you know, Lucas and uh, uh, just about uh, John Dykstra, just about every special effects guy you can imagine. It was really wonderful to actually meet. He's at, he was an absolutely special man. And um, he was very close friends with a, another mentor of mine, which was Ray Bradbury, who I got to meet and work with. Uh, early in my career, <clears throat> Ray used to come speak at UCLA, and uh, he had a great uh, uh, he had a great need to spread the word to creative people to get them up because he, he felt that pe creative people who love what they do are are are, are what is going to make this world a great place. So, um, and so through him, I got to meet Ray Harryhausen, and it's just a magical person. Just be he, 
just a sweet, happy person, very creative, very diligent. And it's amazing, you know, how he did all what he did before the days of what computer, you know, it's just a lot of hard, you know, laborious work, but with a great vision in mind of what he had, what he had wanted to do. And it was just a, so if you can ever do that at some point, heck, that might be in a couple of years you do that, but you don't have to do it next week. Um, it, would, it would take you a year probably to do it. Uh, we have two uh, questions. We have a five dollar question from uh, the Terror of Death, who says, "Anyone want to talk about the whole Power Rangers Master Toy license going to Hasbro and them adapting Go Buster?" See, I'm not the most versed on Power Rangers, as I remember when it was first being brought to the states when I was young. I was looking at it and I was like, "I don't get it." <laughs> and I, 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 they, they had the big push for the Green Ranger reveals, like, will they survive and stuff? And I, I, I remember I specifically watched that episode because for some reason as a kid, I thought, OK, they're actually going to kill these guys off. And I want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if, if you want somebody who discusses about the likes of that, then go check out Deshinta, who discusses a lot about like Power Rangers and Togetsu series. Yeah, uh, um, like you, you guys know that all that Power Rangers, you know, all, all that um, that Japan, that whole you know Japanese genre of um, Tokusatsu. Yeah, yeah, Tokusatsu. That's what it's called. Thank you very much. It, it, that was like it was way back. You know that. Oh yeah, oh, and, yeah. Uh, it's, it started in kind of a weird adaptation of a pre-existing tokusatsu show, Super Sentai. It, all the fight scenes are from Super Sentai, mm -hmm. and all the yeah. scenes with all of the teen actors talking about saving the world, yeah. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> because, of, because of the popularity, we got in the likes of, let's see, we have Beetleborgs, Tattoo uh -huh. Teenage al yes. uh, Aliens from Outer Space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, and um, wasn't there Rocket Boy? But that was an animation. That was that yeah, was, was Astro Boy. Yeah, Astro, Astro Boy. Yes, he was never done as a live action. I don't I I think so. No, I don't think so. I think it was like I animated. want to say no. Uh, if there's there is a live action Rocket Boy, Boy I think it's something I should force Decker all to watch. quick. So <laughs> yeah. I want to say Alexia Mitchell uh, donated one dollar. No comment. Uh, um, we have a two dollar comment from uh, D dot FC says Decker loving the Phantasm reviews a lot. We have a ten dollar comment from Samuel Martins who says, "Hey Decker, have you got the time to take a look at Shin Godzilla? By the way, I love your videos." And then another two dollar comment from the late late horror show saying, "Hello, my friend John Masari." <laughs> <laughs> Hello, how are you doing? Buona notte, uh, buongiorno, yeah, buonasera. On Shin Shin Godzilla. That was one that I've had scheduled that was supposed to be reviewed by now, but because I'm really late and terrible <laughs> at my job, it hasn't been. Uh, but what, if what, I do say, okay, cut off those ones that were supposed to happen there, didn't happen, and we're just going one a week from here on out, I, I, that doesn't mean I'm never going to review that. It's like, oh, sorry, that was in the cutoff part. I'm just, it's, mm, I, my hands are tied. <laughs> Two two things just before I accidentally may get knocked off here. I hope I don't. Uh, back to um, Astro Boy. The uh, I used to love watching that when I was a kid. And my dad, who grew up during World War II, it was a, a Korean War vet. He heard the theme song. And he goes, "Do you know? Do you know what that song is?" And I go, "No." He says, "That is the Italian fascist anthem." You're kidding me. Yeah, they just changed the words. And so anyway, so that's a little bit of music trivia. And I checked it out later in life. I put them back to back and there it was. They figured if you're going to rip off anything, might as well rip off something from someone who can't steal from you. Uh, the other thing, going back to Bear McCreary, it's Bear McCreary's birthday today. And oh, yeah, that's wonderful. We just want to say happy birthday to Bear. Happy birthday, happy birthday Bear. Happy birthday, Bear McCreary. <laughs> okay. Ah, but yeah, on the uh, topic of classic horrors and such, Child's Play is being adapted into a TV series. Oh, wow. Yes, it is. It, oh. it is being adapted into a TV series. So if you are not excited about Conan, don't worry. There is another option. We are getting a Child's Play TV series by the original writer. Awesome. Uh, no uh, word information about it yet, but uh, he was... Um, interviewed by Bloody Disgusting, which is a um, horror website, I believe, and he was talking more in detail about that. So, yeah, so we actually have a TV series based off of a horror franchise done by the guy who actually wrote it, so that's good to know. Yeah, that's incredible because that's, like, among 
the great American brands in in uh, horror. Uh, uh, child uh, Chucky, right? Child's play is yeah, Chucky. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and it's just just so brilliant. And it's like, what 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 other country in the world would figure all this stuff out? <laughs> so I'm, I'm a little confused by the article because I went went through and read it, and it was saying, you know, Friday the Thirteenth was great, but Jason Voorhees lost his luster. Nightmare on Elm Street was a lot of fun up until Kruger wasn't scary anymore. But Chucky never had that problem, and I'm right. looking at that like, right, Chucky. Yeah, Bride of Chucky, exactly. Right. <laughs> let's see, what, 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 let's see, there's Child's Play 1, 2, and 3, Bride of Chucky, Seed of Chucky. Seed of Chucky. Yeah. And they, they and all then, have their ups and downs. So I'm not saying there's, th- ir- don't they have ir- a, there's nothing good can come out of this character anymore. But I think if you're going to say that the uh, Nightmare on Elm Street series and Friday the 13th went very downhill, you can't say but not child's play. Right. They, they like all said, share a lot more similarities. Bride, Seed, Curse, and I think now Cult of Chucky. Yeah, I think that's the newest one. Uh, right, so there's up to seven now. Commented, so you're saying Astro Boy would be defeated by the Ethiopians? <laughs> <laughs> that would be very appropriate. <laughs> well, so uh, so obviously someone knows something about world history. Yeah, that would be a good... Uh, that would be a good uh, revenge uh, on Astro Boy. But Astro Boy's, he, he's the good guy. He got Dr. Yeah. Elephant. He put them together. It's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean, Astro Boy, uh, there's been a lot of incarnations of Astro Boy. He is essentially like the Mickey Mouse of Japan. Yes. Um, yes. I, even, uh, why, uh, he, I was just thinking, Mickey Mouse of Japan, he has rockets for legs. Yes, yes. There we go. <laughs> yes. Mickey Mouse had death rockets. <laughs> <laughs> Happiest place on earth. Uh, I gotta take care of something. I'll be right back. Yeah, okay. My apologies. No problem. Uh, Can you bring uh, me back a pizza? <laughs> Can you bring or me not. back? Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, no time for pizza then. Uh, uh, can we at least get some pizza rolls? I can, I can I can get a little sponsorship deal and bring them up in the middle of the thing. Hey. Actually, since we're in the middle of the show and we're talking about all kinds of nostalgic stuff, I may as well actually post a uh, Twitter poll for this episode of Live and Wired. So uh, the Live and Wired poll for this episode is, if for one year you could only enjoy nostalgic entertainment, that being movies, games, comic books, or novels, from one decade, which would you pick? Now, to be perfectly clear about this, that means you can still enjoy new stuff. Stuff made this decade, it's okay. But when it comes to stuff from the past, you're limited to one decade of things. Now, it would be the stuff from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, or the 2000s. Because this is this is the end of we're getting into 2018. We're getting the end of the 2010s here. The so 2000s we can't go any counts. earlier than that. We can't go any earlier. Sorry, John. <laughs> <laughs> most most of the viewers of my channel are around my age, and I, the 60s well, didn't happen. There was a TV series <laughs> that came out before I was born, and it was called Science Fiction Theater. And I had only heard about it; I had never seen it, and discovered it on YouTube. And it's absolutely brilliant, but but that's that's all I'll say. I'll keep I'll we'll keep it into the eighties. Yeah. Okay, there we go. There we go. I'm just trying to oh, get thank everything you so much. together. I'm in the middle of a live show. All right, we, this, we are professionals. We are professionals. All right, guys, there is the link. So please go uh, check that out to vote on which decade would you like to see your favorite nostalgic stuff. Okay, I'm going to add that to the... I, I should probably do this before we stream. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's see. I'm going to add it to the description real quick. Okay. This is like, And what were the decades again? We're talking the about the 70s, eight, 80s, 70s. 90s, and 2000s. Okay, so we have 1,000 HUF uh, from Regon, who says, but have you guys heard D&D Kickstarter that reached 1.2 million US dollars in nine days? I I think I remember a little bit about that, but I can't remember exactly what it was for. Yeah, I, I haven't heard about it. 
I, I remember seeing something, and it's like Dungeons and Dragons. It's an important thing to me, but I didn't have enough time to really be like, okay, I'm gonna click and check that out because I'm all sitting everywhere, like trying to script. <laughs> it's been really fun getting the most use out of my surface that you can. I mean, uh, uh, the Phantasm Two review. When I was posting that around, I literally was on the highway. I was in the back seat of a car with the surface tethered to the phone's Wi-Fi. No, four G to Wi Fi tethering on the phone. We're just posting on Twitter and on Facebook and everything from the backseat of a car driving down the highway because I had so much stuff going on, and I'm still trying to get work done. <laughs> oh, fun! Yeah, uh, I personally never played Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, I did know a few friends from college who did, and I tried to get in like maybe a round or two and try to learn how the um, game went, but I could never really understand it. A uh, comment from 123788-78444Games asks, on the topic of D&D, when's the next D&D episode, Decker and Dragons? And that's <laughs> been on the back burner for years. I'd really, really like to get back on that. But one of the things about doing Decker and Dragons is the easiest way to feel inspired and get it going is to actually be playing at the time. And I've been having so many other things going on. I really, you need time to play Dun Dungeons and Dragons when you play it. Yeah. Like, yeah. Not not only does a session of gameplay last four or more hours, uh, but preparing for that also takes quite a bit of time. Okay, we got another two pounds from Toby Kirby who says, Glove compartment key, you will in uh, inevitably lose. <laughs> Thank you. We're getting wow. all the pieces together. It, yeah, it's, they've, seen my street, yeah. they've seen my gameplay of my summer car. They know I know how to put it together. <laughs> I don't know how to drive it. Might end up getting creamed on the highway soon after, but... I can put the next car together in like two hours. It's fine. That's true. Yes. So, um, while while we're on the topic, does anybody want to play a game? Oh, Why boy. do I suddenly feel very, very afraid of that? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, creepy. It's not going to be anything creepy. Uh, not. I mean, not, you know, pun. Um, but th don't worry. Um, we uh. usually have our YouTube news, but I found this little um, article a few days ago discussing about YouTube comments. And uh, the game is called, Can You Match the YouTube Comment to the YouTube Video? Yay! Wow. So I'm sure that us as content creators, we get a lot of weird comments, like really, really weird comments. And uh, this person right here at New Statement has put together some of the weirdest comments that she was able to find on various videos. And we have to guess, where did this comment come from and which video? So... Let's do, uh, here's an example. So, uh, we have a comment from John Ray who says, good that a lot of women wore hats. And this is from the video of Guide Me Out, uh, Guide Me O Thou, Great Redeemer, being sung at the royal wedding by Prince and William, Prince William and Kate Middleton. So, good that a lot of women wore hats. That makes sense. This is going to be fun. All right. So, let's start off with our very first question. By Avo, he says, what if pigeon craps on it? This comment comes from what? Drawing with 100-year-old pencils, how to catch pigeons' best bird trap, how to make tomato paste in Sicily, or upside-down umbrella idea. See, unfortunately, an actual I, think comment no, I, think earlier, I did already do this question, so I know the answer, but I gotta say I got it wrong. <laughs> well, I, I don't. I don't think any of the uh, choices are correct. I, I think these, these are correct. Oh, okay. Are I was going to say. Uh, I, I thought that was an option. Uh, or no, other. no. There's there is other no would be e, none of the above. <laughs> my other would be have something to do with statues, uh, forgotten <laughs> statues. But anyway. No, it's not statues. I'd okay. go with D. D upside down I'm, umbrella idea. That, that's the one I was going to go with. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's try D. Oh, it's wrong. It's how to make tomato paste in Sicily. That's that was going to be my hard. next guess. Believe that's, it or pretty, not. that's pretty disgusting. Yeah, I take it that maybe the person was outside when he was making it. So uh, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, that's nice that's okay. Here. Let's Thanks. try question number two. This vid made me overcook my pasta. Was it from the music <laughs> video of Fountain of Wayne, Stacy's mom, I mean, a montage of Gordon Ramsay's being kind to elderly people? A Pizza Hut training video from 1998, or the Emoji Movie trailer. Okay, well, it's not the Pizza uh, 
it's not the Pizza Hut training because they don't make spaghetti, correct? Am I correct? Pizza <laughs> Hut doesn't make spaghetti. No, I, I mean, well, I mean, if it, the Pizza Hut ninety eight, well, I don't do. think so. I mean, they they do now, but they don't make. Oh. They don't make pub. I didn't think they'd make pasta in the nineties. Right. Uh, you know what? I I feel like Gordon Ramsay. Gordon Ramsay with the elderly people. I, I'm going I, with that. I think that that might be too. I'm going to go with the music video just because I think that's that that's kind of like the Sicily thing. It just doesn't make sense. Okay. All right. So, so we're gonna go say so, mom. Creepy, what do you yeah. say? I say a Stacy's mom. All right. Let's see if it's Stacy's mom. Yes, it is Stacy's mom. Uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> this vid made me overcook my pasta. The music video for Stacy's mom. Okay. Wow. I used to hear that song all the time back in college. Okay. Number three. I've done it, and I'm seven. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, yeah. technically, then, he's not supposed to be on YouTube for th six more years. <laughs> I know. Sure. So what does this come from? Is it from Tutankhamen, Common, The Truth Uncovered HD Full? How to play for Elise, Ludwig von Beethoven piano tutorial, biggest cinnamon challenge ever destroyed, or how to care for your Himalayan salt plate. I'm scared that it's a cinnamon challenge. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm going for, gosh, I'm going to go the musical route. I'm going to say how to play Fear de Lis by Ludwig von Beethoven. You're trying to give us a little hope for society. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, just, you know, I'm just trying to put a little bit of class in this. <laughs> All right. What do you say, Creepy? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna side. The Johns are gonna be united in this one, and I'm gonna go with that. Well, I right. must uh, please we go. let it be for Elise. Oh no! I am so sad that I'm right. <laughs> Gosh, God, you are cinnamon. good. I am so unhappy. Wow. But I want to know what the hell a cinnamon, uh, no, a, a, a Himalayan salt plate is. You actually eat off of it, or I don't even know what it is. Do you I'm put not it, sure like, under your pillow to draw out impurities from your skin. I mean, what what would you use a Himalayan salt plate for? See, I, I have know, a Himalayan I salt just lamp. A plate uh, made of salt, because that would just you know all I'd have to worry about is putting pepper on my steak. Just all right. right let's go right. over to question number four. Uh, Lazy Dog says, this was before the feminist took over. The feminist. The, the, yeah, the, it's feminist. What? He spelled yeah. it wrong. Right. I'm okay. <laughs> sarcastic. Okay, so what is it from? Homemade chicken pot pie, how to make pot pie recipe, mm. Avril Lavigne skater boy, trend spotting mm -hmm. at height exes, or fairy liquid, 1991 UK advert. God. Mm. This was before I'm, the feminists took over. Fe before I'm the gonna say train spotting at Hythe. B. And, and I think the, and, and, I, and, and and I think that chicken pot pie is a little too easy, huh? Yeah. It's a little too <laughs> obvious. Okay, that that's the uh, the red herring. Uh, mm. I'm gonna go for the train spotting, and I don't even know why. Okay. So what do you say, Decker? Train spotting. Okay, train spotting. No, Creepy oh. got it right. It is wow. the Gator Boy. <laughs> Except that this is kind of ironic because if you've ever listened to Skater Boy, this was like during like the post-punk era, not feminist. Yes, okay. yes. I have no idea what this comment means. Yeah, yeah. Like if if uh, if you've actually if you're if you know anything at all about the punk music movement, like. There are so many punkers who hate. Oh, the immortal her. JR says, "Take a drink every time they ignore your comment." <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, there's a lot going on. Yeah, too much. We're actually behind. Question number five: The power of Christ compels you. Which is this from? Hilarious moment countdowns. Rachel Riley spells out bumhole. New Cadbury's eyebrow dance advert. Selena Gomez tearfully accepts Woman of the Year at Billboard's Women in Music 2017 or Easy Lemon Chicken Marinade Recipe. The power of Christ compels you. Lemon Chicken Marinade. Okay. Well, that, that, you know what? I, I was caught between that and the Selena Gomez. Uh, you know, just to be different, I'm going to go with the Selena Gomez. All right. How are you, creepy? Lemon chicken. Lemon chicken lemon marinade. All right. Doing the lemon chicken ah, marinade. No. no, it's neither of you guys. Ah, Cadbury's oh, eyebrow dance advert. Ah. Okay. So, yeah, creepy eyebrows equals that you're being c controlled by Satan. Okay. So, number six. This is life in a nutshell. 
Is it from 100 Mentos being placed inside a Coca-Cola bottle? Oh, boy. A dental hygienist was discussing the most efficient and easy way to brush your teeth. A YouTuber was cutting open a squeezy toy with nail scissors, or two children were taste testing 20 flavors of Pringles. Oh, wait a minute. Nutshell uh, is the clue. Hold on a second. Can I see the screen again, please? Yeah, sure. Can, can I call a friend to help me with this? <laughs> <laughs> sure, if it was like 18 years ago. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, here it is. Can you see it? No. Um, gosh. Uh, I, I want to go last. All right. So two children were taste testing 20 flavors of Pringles. I'm going to say cutting open a squeezy toy with nail scissors. I'm going to say A, the, the Coke bottle full of Mentos. Oh, wow. So it looks like I'm going to be the tiebreaker. So okay, um, um, I'm going I'm to get, get a little randomizer. So let me just do that really quick. I actually do have a randomizer that I use for cool. when I do uh, a, an episode of Pix Mix with Aaron Metta. We do, we're do reviewing all the Pixar movies, and we actually do it in a random order. Let me just do that really quick. Okay, we got C. So okay. and I, I'm going go to I'm, I'm gonna go open with A. I'm going to oh. go with A. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, well, all right, fine. We'll do A. Why not? Okay. 100 Mentos. No, it's uh, C. Oh, we should have gone with a randomizer. I'm the master. Well, I, I, I want to point out at this time that I don't think I have gotten one right. Or <laughs> have I? No, I think I got the, the, the further least, the Beethoven one. Was that it? No. No, that wasn't get, even it at all. I didn't, even get anyone, right. I didn't get anyone right. Well, that's that's actually, I'm almost kind of proud of myself. I didn't get anything right yet. Good. You actually, good. That's that's actually a good thing. Okay, last one. I cringed. It looked like my testicle. No. Oh. <laughs> my everyday winter makeup routine by Zoella. Donald Trump's wig reveal. What we ate today as a vegan couple or freaky eaters Yorkshire pudding addict. Um... Okay. We go with the Yorkshire pudding. That's that's a okay. good guess. Um, All right. Uh, uh, creepy, you go because uh, I want to go last again. I think that the uh, vegan couple is just kind of trying to get. That's the red herring. That's the red herring. You're like, oh, vegans, they eat the plants like monsters. <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> go <laughs> with Donald. There we go. Trump. Okay, Donald, Donald Trump. Trump. All right. I'm, only because I came up with a new word uh, for, uh, you know, when you have like a meat with the vegetables. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, someone asked me, what are we having for dinner? We're having a grilled chicken with assorted vegetalia. So I'm going to pick <laughs> what are what we ate as a vegan couple. That's what Okay, so we got B, C, and D. Uh, I'm going to go with the random wheel again. <clears throat> uh, C. So what we ate today as a vegan couple. I, I got one right? Yeah. No, no. actually, no, it's it, Donald Trump wig. Oh! <laughs> oh, bummer. Okay, I was about to give you my acceptance speech. Well, cool. I, good, I, for, good for you, Creepy. You won. I got All it. Right. Well, who's, who's, who's got the high score so far? I, I didn't keep track. I don't either. I think I, think I won. won like or, most or, or, well, it's yeah. just important to know that I have not gotten one right yet. Okay. That's okay. All right, uh, so yeah, that's our little game, everybody. I hope you guys had fun. Wait on the top on the topic of YouTube, oh, though, there starting is to still, have fun. There, there, there was the YouTube's dark side. Oh my them. God! When I send this to you, oh man, you said that you wanted to read this. I, like, I wanted to give it a dramatic reading. Oh, please do so. This will be fun. Let me just let me just okay. pull it up real quick. Um, well, I I can pull it up. Over, I don't know. Should I mean? Should, is it better to see my face? Yeah, I think. Of course. Um, I, okay, you okay. You know what? I'll I'll let you pull. I'll let you do it. Okay, let me click on that. Yeah. Yes, open the link. Yeah. it's is it? it? Yes, open link. That's why I clicked the link. Do you want to open this link? Yes, yes, I do. That's that's why I clicked. Thank um, you, we Windows have a 10. we have a ten dollar uh, MX wow. from Geo's channel with no comments. Thank you so much, Geo's ah, channel wow. for Geo. Cool. Yes. Yes. Okay, this, this is on CNBC. From their yes. mo from the category modern medicine, uh, an article by Josephine Bilia. YouTube's dark side could be affecting your child's mental health. As parents increasingly question the effects technology has on their children's health and well-being, 
Many are alarmed by a slew of reports coming out about malicious content on YouTube targeting children as young as two years old. That's a, an advanced two-year-old there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be fair, when I was two, I was playing Pac-Man on a Tandy 1000. But I think that's a little simpler than working YouTube. You got to know how to read or write something. Well, you can poke things, I guess. And but. type. <laughs> But, also, I mean, there's, there's one thing to keep in mind, I think, throughout all of this is the fact that YouTube's terms of service specify that you're supposed to be at least 13 years of age mm, to use the site. Sense. That makes sense. Yeah. I... Uh, speaking of two, thank you so much for the $2 donation to the I Evolution agree. 78. But, yeah, I do agree that you have to be uh, at least 13 to have a YouTube account. But I'm, I, I think I'm guessing that maybe parents would watch, like, uh, preschool shows for their kids that are on YouTube. I think that there are some services like that, so maybe that's why um, you know kids are watching YouTube. I mean, I even know that there are some kids who actually can use their phones really well. It's it's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the article continues, of course. In of course. recent months, parents and psychotherapists have reported that perpetrators have manipulated content from well-known beloved children's franchises, such as Entertainment One's Peppa Pig, Nickelodeon's Paw Patrol, and Disney's Frozen and Mickey Mouse and inserted inappropriate and disturbing content involving popular characters. According to medical experts, this content has an adverse effect on the developing brain. Children who repeatedly experience stressful and or fearful emotions may underdevelop parts of their brain's prefrontal cortex and frontal lobe, the parts of the brain responsible for executive functions, like making conscious choices and planning ahead, said Donna Volpet Volpe Volpietta, Ed D. Good. Founder yeah. of the Center of the Resilient Center for Resilient Leadership. That's a pretty specific center. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, children's brains are developing, and like, I wouldn't think that you'd want to have a kid sit down and just take in hours of like the Saw franchise, followed by right. uh, followed by the Human Centipede. But I also don't think that they're the target audience and the target demographic. And I think I mean, the, 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 the things about this article going on about the malice involved, I'm thinking, yet that's quite a claim to say that the people who make just what I assume is just kind of joke content about, hey, here's a Disney character in a horror situation. Mm -hmm. there, there's surprise involved there's a joke there there's plenty of things that it can be besides malicious and trying to target kids and mess up their brains mm -hmm. right and it's uh, there's a uh, thing it's like always don't ever assume malice where ignorance can be a decent enough explanation mm -hmm. true and this i feel like this article is kind of failing on that point but it continues this, uh, this this feels like one of those articles that i remember coming out when i was young that would inevitably end up in my parents' hands that were tailored to to incite panic in adults, mm -hmm. and especially in parents, you know, that was tailored to make parents freak out. Yeah. What's worse, some of this content is filtering down into YouTube Kids, an app launched by Google in 2015 that has 11 million viewers and is supposed to contain only child-friendly content. These offending videos are only a fraction of YouTube's kid-friendly universe, yet they are another example of the potential for abuse on digital platforms that rely on algorithms to complete to police content and the latest in a string of reports that reveal the dark side of technology on young minds. Uh, and <laughs> okay. oh, don't break character. Wait a minute, you were doing good. You were on a roll. Okay. That's it. That's it. That's the no, end. No, no. No, 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 there's more. There's more. Right, and we continue. While most of the digital perpetrators are unknown, what is certain is their intent to do harm is deliberate and is quite easy for a child to stumble upon these video clips. For example, just five clicks into the popular Dave and Ava nursery rhymes and baby songs and YouTube's up next auto feed suggestions pulls up a scary video featuring Nickelodeon's Paw Patrol characters. Paw Patrol is a much-loved cartoon for children ages 2 to 5 about heroic dogs with human jobs. The video, like most in this category, appears fairly inno innocuous in the first few minutes, but becomes progressively darker with time. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
we have a twenty dollar that, comment thing. It's from like, it's... Nerdbane who says, "Wow, twenty, Shiro thank Rain you." May be developing, but YouTube comment will help even it out. Mm -hmm. I, I missed some of that because I wasn't okay. Let me click over the, uh, children's brains. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but the, 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 the thing about assuming malice and assuming just tr deliberately targeting children is like, like I said, you're according to the terms of service, you're not even supposed to have a YouTube account until you're at least yes. 13. Yeah, now, that's YouTube a good point. Kids <clears throat> is a separate thing, but how are things decided that they can be on YouTube Kids? Are they just pulled from YouTube and it uh, just runs the algorithm because as we've seen with the algorithm to try and make sure that everything is absolutely hunky dory and perfectly fine, that doesn't work. I mean, this is, yet again, this this is the fourth episode of Live and Wired and the fourth in a row that has been determined to not be advertiser friendly before it even existed. Well, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to chime in as a dad. Um, and I'm and I'm not going to bore. I'm going to chime in as a dad and a former kid. I remember when I was in kindergarten, um, our school had a border which uh, lined a creek, right, and there was a, a fence there, and we would play by that um, um, chain link fence because we could throw balls really fast at it, and that's where we would. It was our makeshift uh, uh, ball field, right? And right, then right, all right. of a sudden, out of nowhere, this really cool thing started to appear right along the border where we were playing was, was these, um, what do you call it? What, what, what were they back in the day? It was all um, nudist colony magazines. So it's pictures right. full of nude people. We would find them. We, we thought we had pay dirt. We thought that was the <laughs> coolest thing in the world. And we're looking at it and looking at it and looking at it. Then uh, the, uh, the principal found what we were doing. Why are they there? What are they? The kid, the kids at play at playtime reading? What are they doing? He came out and saw what we were doing. Did he get mad at us? No. He goes, guys, thank you very much. And he found out that someone on the other side of the creek was had planted this stuff and watched us and was, you know, basically they found a pedophile on the other oh. side of the creek who was getting off. That's a pretty creepy story, huh? So yeah. someone takes that concept of exposing children to something, uh, you know, they're really not ready to to, to digest yet, right? Mm -hmm. And they get off on that. And people are doing that. In just, it sounds similar in a way. It's a little dram over -dram dramatized, but there are people that do target kids in some way. And so that that's my two cents. That's my okay. Two cents. Okay. So. And I've but, seen it happen at other schools. You know, my kids were in preschool at one time um, <clears throat> here in Hollywood. And all of a sudden there's like, uh, you know, there's a few magazines that they, they have, uh, you know, newspapers that come out that have all the, you know, where all the strip joints and stuff like that. And it would purposely be like, you could tell that they were purposely left there. So, mm -hmm. so this is like a, a spin, this is like a, a web spin on that content uh, concept. Okay. So that's my, right. that's my two cents. I would think that it wouldn't be a very smart way to go about doing it on YouTube, where you have to give YouTube your information and all. It, 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 it's not very, it, it, like I said, it's a, mostly it's, it's a fun. failure of moderation mm -hmm. with you know relying on algorithms to deal with the content because, of course, it is a lot of content. Yeah, but I mean, well, it's it, also it, parenting it's, too. It's, you can't have your kid watching stuff that you're not aware of what the hell they're watching. You just yeah, that, that's a, you know. that. That also goes into this. Everything is. There's, it's not just a little dichotomy. It's there's so many factors in so many areas. Mm -hmm. A lot of people with a lot of things just want to find the bad and destroy it and problem solve. But that's things aren't that no. simple. No, it'll pop up in something in in another form in another way. You know, and and heck, yeah, people uh, people can you know have the right to be <clears throat> benign, take uh, you know do crazy things with like uh, <clears throat> you know, but it it can't it has to be. It's not supposed you know. Parents are supposed to watch what their kids do. You know, you just can't leave your kids, in, 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 you know, un, unsupervised. You know, it's yeah. you know, it, you just can't. But uh, but yeah, I've seen I've seen all kinds of bizarre stuff. I've seen stuff that's unpublishable <clears throat> that was made a, a long time ago at the Disney Company. All the uh, uh, the the, the uh, I'm sure you know this, and all, all the animators were they're just absolute pervs. So there's all oh, yeah. kinds of stuff that hasn't been published. <clears throat> I've heard no, of Walt was sure quite the ass man, <laughs> but uh, you know. But there are things that uh, that just that weren't meant for meant for publication. It was meant for amusement. Right. So you know, where are we going to draw the line? There are some things you could do that, that are gross and disgusting that that are so bizarre and 
and campy and freaky and uh, perverted that are not meant for child you know consumption that doesn't mean uh we have to stop doing it i, I know it sounds it's kind of like a it's kind of like playing i'm playing both sides of the field but you, you just have to watch out what your kids you have to be you have to raise your kids i have two girls that i, I raised since i was a since they were tiny and um yeah they've been exposed to some weird stuff not but not because of me it's just by accident and you know they they know how to deal with it because they have parents that can kind of like explain what's going on if that and nerd bane and commented think- my parents never monitored what i watched and i grew up fine now please plug this into my ass <laughs> <laughs> Nice. All right. Well, we have a lot of other stuff to cover, and I think yes. that um, this topic is getting more than enough long. Yeah, yeah. So, I, agree. I think we've always said so, what we're going um, to say on it. Uh, the, the article does go into a bit about how children exposed to a lot of sexual content on YouTube behave in ways similar to children who are being groomed by pedophiles, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, uh, acting out like humping and such oh man uh which is you know like, like i said it's a, it's a thing where like i if i if there was a four-year-old who watched like my content 24 7 it could mess them mm-hmm. up my content's not for four-year-olds though my yeah. content is well kind of for me mm-hmm. and it, it, it kind of shows in the uh the the, the uh analytics most of the uh, viewers on the channel are around my age and male, mm-hmm. so it mm-hmm. it kind of people find things, and it's mostly it mostly works out. But there are there are issues, there are problems. YouTube has to do a better job with their algorithms, not only to uh, protect the childrens, but mm-hmm. also to protect their creators. Because you know, when you get the heavy-handed things that just absolutely punish everyone, but things still slip through because it's still an imperfect system. Right. That's been the problem from the from day one, and I think that you know personally, something like a YouTube Kids platform should have a lot more actual human moderation to it. Just my mm-hmm. opinion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know it's easier said than done. Yeah. Right. True. But I do feel like John, you made a very valid point here, and this is often the thing that is taken out of these kinds of scare articles is the actual parent factor is the fact like you said you have to raise your own damn kids and i feel like that's something that these kinds of articles either don't address at all or ignore you know is the fact that yeah the is the idea is because the whole point of it is to frighten parents into you know rallying them for a non-existent cause is to scare people but the bottom at the end of the day you have to know what your kids are doing right you have to take right. an interest in what they're doing and you have to know what the hell is going on right so, right and right. i and i will admit i say this as someone who is not a parent who mm-hmm. i do not have kids so mm-hmm. you know but i that's that's my two cents on it too well, it's yes a good, it's a good two cents yeah so uh, why don't we talk about something a little bit more child friendly um it. so we got um Another video game series that might be having a remastered this year. So we have Spiral the Dragon. Mm-hmm. There might be um, the, the trilogy might be remastered, similar to how last year we had gotten the Crash Bandicoot uh, remastered. So, yeah, a lot of people were actually really excited about this. Uh, like the Metroid Prime 4 uh, being developed by Bandai Namco, this was also a rumor. And as of right now, it hasn't been 100% confirmed, but it may be a possibility. So yeah, um, I'm actually really curious about this because there's some people who are saying that they're really excited about this, but then there's some other people who are saying that, um, you know, we already have, um, you know, Skylanders, which are for the younger kids, and maybe Spyro doesn't really need to come back in this day and age. So I'm actually curious. What do you think of this, guys? Well, I was never- you go. You go first. The the, uh, the uh, poll has ended. Oh. Ah. We got mm. 51 votes in 30 minutes. Uh, 10% voted for the 70s. 12% one uh. of the 2000s. 37% the 90s. And the winner, most likely because this poll was asked on my channel, 41% the 80s. 70s. 12%. Uh. And uh, interestingly, uh, there were some uh, comments. 90s and the winner, 
and I'm hearing myself in. There you go. <laughs> I'm echoing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry, so, okay. Uh, Curtis Grant said, "Nah, '60s all the way," and Zana uh, commented, "If I say the '70s, does the entertainment include the weed and LSD?" <laughs> <laughs> I should have specified that. <laughs> should have well, been I mean, it is a form of entertainment for some people, sure. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> That's funny. And Nerdbane says, always excited to see more th 3D platformers making a return for a Spyro. Yeah, that, that is a lot of fun. It's, it's, it's funny because 3D platformers have been coming um, much more popular as of late. Uh, we have Super Mario Odyssey, Ukulele, um, Had in Time. So, yeah, I mean, with the Crash series becoming really popular, and a lot of people are calling it like the Dark Souls of 3D platformers. So, <laughs> it would be nice to see Spyro come back in some way. I mean, we could have um, maybe this will be the boost of the collectathons. Mm -hmm. uh, Griffin Pilgrim says if we're including that stuff, the 80s got cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, but and yeah, uh, 3D platformers were like that was such a major part in the mid 90s because you know the early 90s it was all platformers 2D gaming and then PlayStation generation the uh, you know Sega Saturn N64 suddenly everything has to be 3D take the most popular genre right now make it 3D 3D platforming mm -hmm. is born. Kind of clunky. 3D gaming was really rough around the edges there in more ways than one, but it still worked. But then as time went on, uh, the uh, mid 2000s rolled around and you started getting into uh, the FPS genre was really taking off. Yeah. As the yeah, sam main sandbox genre. as well. And it's been like a over 10 years since 3D platformers really just shrunk down so much. And now. With Crash Bandicoot Remastered and talk of Spyro coming back and with Super Mario Odyssey and a lot of high quality 3D platformers coming out. It's all all tech all the technology has progressed so well in the absence of 3D platformers. And now you've got modern gaming kind of uh, modern gaming what's the word I'm looking for here? Is controls and polish and graphics and all that stuff that you didn't really see much the progression of 3D platformers slowly like you did with the first-person shooter, where it just got a little better and a little better and a little better. Now it looks really, really good. Uh, with the 3D platformer, it was it barely works because it's we can barely do 3D and it's a platformer. And mm -hmm. then it kind of fell off the face of the earth for a bit. I mean, you got the P PS2, you got the Jack and Daxter, and all that. Things were working pretty nice there, but then after that, it's very few and far between. That is true. And yeah, the only, uh, the only uh, the... ones you can really think of as examples came from Insomniac. Like the, I, yeah. I can think of a few on the PlayStation 3 from Insomniac, but other than that, really not many 3D platformers existed. So just seeing so many right now from so many sources, it, it gives a lot of variety, and it's really making it feel like there could be a new sort of renaissance of 3D platforming. Yeah, and I kind of give the praise to Super Meat Boy, uh, you know, with the indie genre, kind of bringing back the platformers in a sense. We've gotten that, uh, we've gotten, um, let's see, Limbo with the cinematic platformer. And, uh, you know, the, and then, of course, a lot of former developers of various companies, they want to see if they can be able to um, get their um, name out there by becoming independent to do their own stuff. Uh, we already had the likes of the former members of Team Rare, now Playtonic, and they're doing ukulele. Uh, we already have Ika, uh, Ika, I'm sorry, uh, who was formerly from Konami. Now he's doing um, his own take on Castlevania Symphony in the Night. Uh, we already right. have um, a hat and time which just came out uh, a couple of weeks ago about a month ago or two um so yes it is nice to see that the 3d platformers have become a lot more popular and i'm i'm actually curious about spyro the dragon because you know in that game you save dragons you collect a lot of gems you go around from world to world so yeah i'm actually really curious to see how that would become a little bit more rev um relevant in today's audience mm. i i feel like i should do my duty and tell you that uh uh, in the original first score was done by Stuart Copeland, which if you know uh, the the band, The Police, he was the drummer. So awesome. he did the score for uh, Spyro the Dragon. Nice. Right. I, I, rem I remember like Spyro the Dragon was a really 
really graphically impressive when it first showed up on uh, PlayStation 1 because it was mm -hmm. one of the first examples in 3D of level of detail being really utilized well, right. where you could actually see very far ahead. It wasn't just you get 20 feet of game level and then a big wall of fog. Yeah, They mm -hmm. actually had, okay, here you have some texturing. There you just have some shading. There you just got flat polygons. Mm -hmm. It just gets yeah. easier to process the further away it is and the less you need to see detail. Right. And mm -hmm. it really worked out well. It was a lot of... It, Spyro is one of the first ones where you finally actually had a kind of sweeping vista in 3D. The levels were still kind of small by today's standards, but it for the time, in a 3D platform, being able to look and see something... A couple hundred feet away was amazing. Very true. Yeah, not to mention that you were able to go from world to world, and each and all, every single one of the worlds have their own unique gimmicks. Uh, they had, you know, characters that you meet up with. So, yeah, each and every single one of them uh, with Spyro d does have any, uh, a lot of unique things. Uh, the second one, uh, you know, you got to meet up with more characters. There was, like, swimming mechanics. The third game, you had skateboarding. You got to play as multiple characters. So, yeah, I mean, with every single Spyro game, they w were able to do something different. Very true. All right. So, um, now we have, I, I guess we can go over to our next topic. And, uh, okay. oh, boy. I thought so, for um, a second that uh, John was just not very happy with the talk of level of details. Like, no, the no, drumming no. was interesting, you bastards. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I just had it something in the other room, and you guys were you guys had it covered. So, <laughs> sorry about that. And no, I didn't want to interrupt your train of thought by telling you, oh, I got to go in the next room to, um, okay. you know, to let the fire department in. Oh, yeah. Okay. No problem. <laughs> and uh, you're absolutely right, Nerd Bane, that uh, Copeland did reuse one of his uh, compositions for the theme of the Amanda show. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. That was for the winter level. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, let's go over to some more movie news. And uh, this ought to be really interesting because it is going into video games. And uh, one of the most hottest video games that a lot of kids are getting into for some reason is Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> so for those who don't know, it's a base off of a, um, you know, like this pizza joint that's kind of like Chuck E. Cheese. And there's like these, uh, you know, animatronics that like try to chase after, well, not chase after you, but like try to go after you and then try to consume you or something. There's like this lore, but I don't know anything about it. Like, uh, as far as I know, it's like it, things are haunted. Just basic explanation for why things are alive. Uh, things are haunted. People died. They're haunting. The animatronic creatures that sing the songs in during the day when the pizza shops open, they kind of come alive at night, and you're the security guard, and you got to keep them where they're supposed to be and stay away from them because they think that you are the little uh, endoskeleton. Yeah, the endoskeleton, right. For I one think. of the suits. So if yeah. they find you, they're going to stuff you in there to put you in the right place, which will happen to kill you, so you don't want them to do that. No. Right. So for the longest time, there have been a lot of rumors going around about a Five Nights at Freddy's movie. Uh, mm. One that was going to be done by, I think it was either Paramount or Universal, but then that was shifted over to Bloomhouse um, Studios. And right now they just got a writer. Now, when you think of a horror movie, a horror movie that involves with kids dying and um, the uh, you know haunted pizza uh, place... What would you think of? And uh, this is actually a surprise because I never expected this in a million years. So Chris Columbus. Chris Columbus is going to write and yep. direct the Five Nights at Freddy's movie. Now, when I think of Chris Columbus, I think of Mrs. Delphire. I think of the first two Harry Potter movies where yes. they're light and they're uh, comedic. And, um, yeah, I don't think of Chris Columbus for something that is involving with horror and murder and, mm -hmm. you know, animatronics that are haunted by kids who were killed so well, horror yeah. and comedy actually do kind of rely on yeah. some of the same aspects as each other mainly i'm thinking yeah. of you could just call it surprise yeah i wouldn't under, i wouldn't underestimate um chris columbus at all in, in that genre oh i don't know i don't know i mean of it all i just I'm, I'm actually really surprised that they were able to pull this uh you know they were able to announce this mm-hmm I mean, I'm, th I'm, I'm thinking, like, Five Nights at Freddy's is known a lot for the jump scares. And jump scares, like, really annoy me in horror because they're so predictable. But yeah, Chris Columbus like could either. maybe do it in a way that actually 
does involve a little surprise. Yeah. Because he has he has that skill. He can surprise you because that's what you need to do to make comedy work. And that's what you need to do to make horror work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's right. It's all timing. Uh, any any horror movie that I've worked on, the directors were very, very specific. You know, it says that hit that you're doing comes in literally two frames late. I need it to come in when the hand is just entering the frame. You barely see the tip of the finger. That's where the hit has to go because the brain is going to, I mean, timing is everything with uh with horror that's that's the only thing that makes it work is is the timing just like with comedy the time you know of course you have a have great contact great story but it's that timing of, of the way you orchestrate things as they come in that just like make completely um uh memorable moments for the audience that the, they'll never forget oh yeah yeah, you, no, you, I've never played any of the games. So I with know. a joke, you've got the setup and the punchline, and mm -hmm. with a scare, you've got the suspense and the shock, or the or the uh, uh, the uh, the illusion that everything is safe, and mm. then the shock. You know, uh, right. all sorts of, uh, of formulas for that. And they just the, the it, as long as they can keep this. Uh, one thing I love in horror movies is when throughout the movie it can just maintain this feeling of dread. Mm -hmm. that's that's very powerful and one one thing that i've been one thing i did recently that i on my gaming channel i've been playing doki doki literature club <laughs> and that that kind of cheats a bit because you know it's very scary when it gets going but mm -hmm. to complete the story it takes about eight hours so most movies don't really have that kind of time <laughs> And I don't know where Creepy is. I think something might have happened. Uh oh. I okay. think maybe he's speaking of the devil. He's, he's oh, there back. you are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh -oh. you, have to, repeat you have to repeat everything you said in the past uh, since Creepy was gone. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> and go. Uh, five nice phrases about scary stuff, and the kids die, and then they turn into the animatronics and stuff. People in there, they die too. It's not a good thing. Also, Doki Doki Literature Club hurt my brain. Ah. There you go. And that's it in a nutshell. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Ten out of ten. I see myself has gotten the better end of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, all right. Uh, I guess there's not really much to say about it. I mean, I've never even played the game, so it would be kind of interesting on where Chris Columbus wants to focus on. Does he want to focus on the lore, or does he want to just focus like straight to the point in which, like, you know, you yeah. get introduced to the security guard, and then you get introduced to the pizza place, and then you just sit down into one room, look at the cameras, and okay. then you're supposed to like shut the doors or something, and then like the the, the animatronics come and capture you or something. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Fred, this, are, this actually Pilgrim would be. Says related. that in fairness, the normal visual novels hurt my brain too. That is true. <laughs> Wait, there's books of it? I thought it was just the games. Uh, no, 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 no. He's talking about like with with, uh, with Doki Doki Literature Club versus the other visual novels I've played on the gaming channel that are actually supposed to be like dating things, where it's just the protagonist comes in, he has no discerning features, he's boring as ever, and he just so happens to be surrounded by women who really want to do him. Wonderful. <laughs> It's All just right. so, um, so like, uh, Toby, Toby Kirkby gave you another two pounds saying spare glove compartment key. I'll see. Go. They're going to lose the first one, but I got the spare t now. And that you can lose that one too. Woo! Also, I want to say that if there is a Five Nights at Freddy game, movie. Uh, a movie based on the game, I feel like it needs to have a screaming Markiplier making a cameo. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yes, but, yeah, I'm thinking like a way uh, that it could work that might be a little cliche in horror, but might work for Five Nights at Freddy's would be just kind of starting out innocently enough. New security guard that this place, you know, got got the job. Yeah. Show up to work. Things seem normal. And then as things progress, then is kind of introduced to. Oh, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, this is a problem. They do kind of come to life. You, you, you're not going to, you, you don't want to do that. And then over time, learning about the backstory and all that stuff. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, that, it, it, maybe it maybe like, a little cliche in my mind, but I think it would work for Five Nights at Freddy's because Five Nights at Freddy's, that's sort of how the first game opened up. It's like, hey, you're in the seat, you're the security guard. And then you get the call over the intercom. It's like, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, they, they walk around a bit. You want to keep them where they're supposed to be. They just do that. Don't Don't worry too much about it. <laughs> Maybe like have uh, 
the security guard who works there at night uh, listens to the radio, and one of the things he listens to is a radio program, and Markiplier is the guy who is doing the radio announcer's voice or something like that. If they <laughs> don't get Mark- Markiplier to actually play the lead, because I can actually imagine Markiplier like is his acting debut in a, in in on the silver screen. He's like. You know, okay, we've seen some of your videos. We know you have the screaming in terror part of the character down pat. There's no need for you to rehearse that part. <laughs> that would be yeah, crazy. So, Markiplier. Yeah, Markiplier will be playing the security guard. Yeah. Okay. Well, if it ever does happen, you heard it here first. That's true. All right. So, uh, let's go over to our next topic. Uh, let's see. Let's go over to back onto the YouTubes. Well, more specifically, let's go over to Google because uh, yeah. mm-hmm. um, you know, we don't about... talk about like video game and streaming and all that stuff. So, I guess in retaliation to everything that's been going on, we are getting a uh, video game streaming service courtesy of Google, and the company might be making a console for it too. So that's yes. kind of interesting because it's sort of. A uh, mix between, uh, what was it called? I want to say Gamefly, but that was the Netflix of games. But as when Netflix was just you ordered from the mail on the yes, that, that was it was it was called Gamefly, TV. yes. Uh, but there was the other one, and I think Gamefly also used to do the service where it was a, a streaming part of it. I can't, or they purchased it for a bit. But it's like game streaming kind of works and kind of doesn't because you need good internet to really get it going, and uh, but also, I mean, Google, they can set up more servers than pretty much anyone else who would try to do this. Uh, so yeah. they, they could really work on the whole problem with latency. But at the so same it kind time, of, it kind of reminds it, me of, um, Apple, the, Apple. The, the streaming game service has been attempted many times, and all of them kind of don't work for their own reasons. So yeah, just because Google's did, trying it, I don't know if that's really going <laughs> to... How is that, that going to work out? I don't know. Yeah, it definitely kind of reminds me of um, the Apple Pippin in which, like, oh, Apple was this huge company with making these computers. I'm sure they'll do really well with making a console. Mm-hmm. Nope, they didn't. Mm-hmm. Oh, and uh, Michael Wolf even said a good example. It'll be like the Oya, and it'll crash and burn just like the Oya. Oh, yeah, I, I, remember, I forgot about that console that came out a few years ago. Right. Yeah, Nerdbane says game streaming has always been pretty hit and miss. And also, I mean, it's like you've got the miniaturization of uh, technology as it is right now. So it's like there's a trade-off when you're streaming. You can't have it too high resolution. You can't have it too high frame rate. You can't have it too high quality. Uh, But if that's the trade-off you're making, like right now I've got my Surface Pro 4 here. I got Steam installed on it. Uh, My fiance, she really likes Fallout 4, so I just downloaded New Vegas since I had it. And uh, plugged it into the TV, plugged the Xbox controller into the side of the Surface, and she was playing Fallout 4 on the Surface on the TV, and she could, uh, no, not Fallout 4, Fallout New Vegas. And she could have been playing it on PlayStation Now, on a mm-hmm. PS4, but the lag from the streaming service is too annoying for her. <laughs> so th- we'd rather have a lower quality Well, actually, it's playing on a PS3 on PlayStation now and then being streamed. So it actually it's playing higher quality on the Surface than it does on the PS3. But there's something you have to there's something you have to consider that we're here in the United States, in Europe and in Asia. They have incredibly uh, efficient, high uh, high um, high bandwidth, incredible Mm -hmm. Internet. I I could Uh, see a streaming gaming service working in, say, South Korea. And in Asia, and in yeah, all throughout Asia, and in um, uh, and especially in Europe, because I have relatives that come here from Europe, and they go, "What the heck's going on? Uh, this is like taking, you know, it's normally would take instantaneously. Something's taking four seconds, you know, mm-hmm. and they Only think four seconds. Wrong with their wow. phone. 
Oh, yeah, that's how that's how impatient they are with it. Right, I'm like, damn, internet that only takes four seconds to do no, something. No, no, it's like you're loading up something, you know. No, I know, that's what I'm saying, too. <laughs> instantaneous stuff. No, no, if they have to wait for a minimum of four seconds, they get really pissed off, you know. Yeah. Whereas, oh, no, even we're I'm like, if it only took four seconds, that would be amazing. Yeah, but, yeah. but yeah, the so US I think, I think huge this, gaming markets, this but might it's be. also a pretty large piece of land everything's yeah. very far apart and yeah. the infrastructure for the internet is not very good yeah right oh yeah i, 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 I can talking. talk i i i i'm I'm a, I'm a great commentator i talk over everyone all at once i got john masari here it's an amazing opportunity he's talking and i'm just like hey you have to, hey, you hey, have hey, to do it hey. with two hands you have to do it with two hands <laughs> masari like there you go there you go you masari. got it John. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> what were you I going to eventually say? learn how to pronounce things no i won't no well it, <laughs> no, tell, tell them how you uh, previously pronounced my name which i found fascinating well john was the first one on to the uh, hangouts room when we were setting up besides myself of course and uh, the first one of the first things he said was like by the way you call me john masarai which is nice it's very interesting it's a nice nice way of going about it but Technically, Masari. <laughs> oh, you rolled your R very well. That's really good. <laughs> and we both revealed uh, that our, our our secret code names that no one can know. So don't Do don't you have get... secret code names. Yes, yes. I'm sorry, that secret I, I, that spilled out. I shouldn't have given. I shouldn't have said that. I don't know why. I just... Forget that I said that. No, we don't have secret. Forgetting. Code names. Moving I, on. I just made that up. <laughs> Speaking of streaming, yeah. uh, Cloverfield Paradox. Yes. Oh yes, yeah. We we did discuss about this a few weeks ago yeah. because um, the fall. Like I mentioned before about the Super Bowl. So the Super Bowl mm -hmm. did reveal about Cloverfield Paradox, and uh, the next day, like mm -hmm. right after we posted up our third episode of Live and Wired, that's when it came out on Netflix. Yeah. So uh, it came out oh. and it had like five million viewers in seven days, but uh, it's currently having like mixed to negative reviews and also mm -hmm. in that same article it was talking about like altered carbon which is another um netflix series that we did talk about it's actually getting like low uh, low views or something so yeah uh, but yeah cloverfield paradox uh pulling in five million viewers in seven days after surprise release that's awesome that's a lot yeah that is a I, lot. i'd be happy Absolutely. with those numbers yeah. i'd be very happy yeah, that's true <laughs> I have to admit, I have not watched it yet. I have seen review for it, though. Yeah, and they're very mixed, right? Sorry, right what? They're, they're very mixed. Yeah, they're very. They're I, I mean, yeah. like the review I saw for it was like they didn't trash it, you know, but they mm -hmm. did admit that if some parts of it. Basically, what they what it narrowed down to was uh, the reviewer is actually a good friend of mine, but mm -hmm. he said it was not awful but not really great either it had right. some really good parts to it but there were also a lot of parts to it that he felt like were you know either not done right or could have been dropped altogether right you know yeah. is like it's it's basically he said it's a mixed bag but i can't say that he he said he didn't regret watching it so yeah i i almost have this opinion of the um or this i shouldn't say an opinion uh uh, an impression of the audience of the genre wanting to tell the story their way and when it's not told their way like for alien for instance every alien covenant came out and everyone says well i was expecting this and i was expecting that and i was expecting the other thing you know uh and i don't know is it the is it the audience is like a little too too sophisticated or it has too much expectation when they're going to the route, you know, okay, it's been made for you to sit back and enjoy the story. But there are people, you know, with the reviews that I read, I have not seen it. I would like to see it. But the responses are, you could just see people were like, had an expectation, expectation of the, uh, of the, of the, of that particular title that just wasn't fulfilled. And it's like, you know, I mean, I think people just need to let it, you know, take it, take it in. You know, I, I, I'm trying to be fair with my reviews. I know I did have expectations with Alien Covenant, and right. what the thing—the thing that kind of bothered me is like so much of the advertisement said that it was so scary. It was such a scarier than the first, and it was like that's right. a big claim. But not only was did I not really find it scary, I found it not even really a horror movie. I found it to be more like artsy action. 
Right. Mm-hmm. So, right. I mean, for what it did, I think it did okay. I'd I'd call it about a three. Mm-hmm. It's not a bad movie, but it's three out of five. Mm-hmm. I, I yeah, three out of five. Okay. I, I do the out of fives. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Three out of ten. And he, three. Out and of he refuses to do out do things by halves. Like Dicker will not <laughs> give a movie a half star rating. Three and a half no. star rating. Now, Patricia, have you seen it? Patricia? I'm not sure if she might she might have stepped away for a bit. Okay. Oh well, uh, uh, since since I'm a composer and since Cloverfield is uh, was composed by a very good friend of mine, Barry McCreary, I got to say what was really fascinating. If you should, I would encourage people to check out is all the behind the scenes regarding creating the music score. He did an awesome uh, video series. You can check it out on his uh, on his. Um, on his webpage and obviously on his YouTube channel, but uh, he really goes deep into it and he just does incredible coverage uh, about his uh, musical, uh, the development of the score, him working with the director, actually recording it. Um, right. You know, it's really good. I don't know if you saw, what was that um, Friday? Oh my goodness, the, 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 the horror movie that came out about happy Friday the 13th birthday or something like that. Oh my God, I'm forgetting the title. Uh, Happy Death Day. Happy Death Day, uh, where he got his his two and a half year old daughter to do like this creepy voice, you know. And so he has all kinds of videos showing how he goes about uh, doing that. It's really fascinating. You, uh, mm-hmm. that, that would be a those would be great movies, uh, great videos for you to like do a quickie review of uh, mm-hmm. one of you guys. So, anyways, so that's the that's the uh, the music aspect of uh, Cloverfield uh, covered. Awesome. Did I see? Yeah, really awesome. Oh, oh so there you are. Yeah, sorry about that. I had something to take care of. Uh, no did problem. you? Uh, so, did you see it was Cloverfield right Paradox? When John asked you a question. <laughs> yeah, did you? Did you see Cloverfield Paradox? Uh, no, I have not. I haven't okay. had the chance. Yeah, me neither. I will. I might check it out tonight. I think hmm. tonight's a good movie night. So that'd be good. Yeah. All right. Uh, we Game actually do have a few more things to cover. So, yes, uh, Game of Thrones. So, uh, <laughs> Game of Thrones is becoming really popular lately. And uh, the guys who created Game of Thrones are going to be helping developing a few new Star Wars films, uh, mm. more specifically like uh, the spin off series, not like mm-hmm. from the main core storyline. Right. I'm like, I, I hear this and I'm just like, wow. <laughs> like, everything I imagine about Game of Thrones and what I know about Game of Thrones, I think applying that to Star Wars, and I'm just like, a part of me wants to avoid this like the plague, and another part of me is fascinated by Mm -hmm. the idea. See, I always wanted to know what a fully naked Twilight looked like. (laughs) You you got it! but it's just a curiosity. I'm just curious. I like scientific analysis. I need a full specimen. Thank you very much. I, I don't know if we can go on a tangent about Star Wars. Oh my gosh, I'm 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 losing all my Star Wars title. Uh, the first Star Wars that J.J. Abrams produced and directed was Force Awakens. Force Awakens. Yeah. Okay, I would love I would have loved to have someone have while I was watching the video have a uh, uh, a camera looking at me. I went to it. I went to screening on the Disney lot, and. If they should just have my reactions to the movie at one particular point where I saw Max von Sydow was in the movie, mm-hmm. and I thought, and I went to my wife. I go, oh, "This is gonna be fantastic. This is gonna be absolutely fantastic." Why? That's Max von Sydow. He's an insanely great actor. I mean, oh, I had set, that's high expectations way up here. And then, and, and she's, "Well, I, I don't think I'm familiar with him. Oh, he he played Jesus. He's just great. Just watch it." And all of a sudden, he dies. <laughs> he gets killed, and I'm going. Wait a minute. He hasn't. He's been there for like two minutes. What happened? I was so. I almost walked out. I was. Just, wait, wait a minute. That that's. I was cheated out of that. But anyways, that's my that's my Star Wars story there. So, right. Uh, anyways, <laughs> I have a Star Wars story, but it's not as interesting as that. Is that um, on, uh, the year that the Force Awakens came out, I actually saw it with my godmother, who has been around to appreciate Star Wars. When it came out in like when it first came out in 1977, when you know right. the very first Star Wars movie hit theaters, she was there for it. Right. So we went to see 
Star Wars The Force Awakens on Christmas Day at our local theater. Uh-huh. And according to the uh, one of the people behind the concession stands, I'm like, not sure what you if there's like an official term for pe- that particular place of employment, but at least, you know, one that's official and is not insulting. But mm-hmm. according to them, in our area, they had only sold about 100 tickets total to that movie. Oh, wow. Uh, Nerdbane says, so many good actors made a cameo, but contributed so little. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> well, it's just like, hey, we're well, making a new die. Star Wars. You want to be in it? Yes! It's like, well, we got a lot of them. Uh... You're going to well, be we sitting have all in the cantina when they walk now. by and uh, <laughs> take a sip of the blue milk. I don't know. Is it is it true that, like, uh, I, for, I forgot the actor that plays James Bond. Um, the that's, actor that's, that, that's a pretty nonspecific. <laughs> the actor yeah. that plays the, the most recent James Bond. Ah. Daniel Craig. Right, Daniel, Daniel Craig. Craig. Daniel yeah. Craig. Right. Thank you, Patricia. Daniel Craig was in it. And it's like, where was Daniel Craig? And someone said oh, he was wearing one of the, you know, he was one of the, is that true that he was one of the uh, stormtroopers? I don't know. Is that Possible. absolutely true? Okay. Or I thought that was just urban legend, you know, because everyone wanted to say they were in Star Wars, you know, and uh-huh. I looked at him on IMDB and for crying out loud, there he is, but I don't see uh-huh. him. And it, it didn't matter to him that he was just going to, you know, uh, James Bob up. says he was. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank and Nerdbane says he was the brainwashed stormtrooper. Oh, good. Uh, good. N- number four or 69? Oh, or oh yeah, 80? yeah, yeah, that's right. That's That was There's like a thousand of them. Uh-huh. He, 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 the one who, uh, who just fell for Ray's mind tricks like uh-huh. instantly. And I'm so sorry, Patricia. We got off of Game of Thrones and went to Star Wars. So, yeah. That's okay. I mean, it, That's Star problem. Wars is what we're talking about in the first yeah. place anyway. Because okay, we're working right. on the spinoffs of Star Wars. Yeah, so yeah. it's fine. We are staying on topic anyway. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm just trying to think what a uh, Game of Thrones creators creating a Star Wars trilogy would look like. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if it was in the perspective of one of the slaves from Jar Jar. I mean, not Jar Jar. Um, Jabba the Hutt. <laughs> Jabba the Hutt. Yeah, Jabba the Hutt. And maybe like one of the perspectives of Jabba the Hutt. Like maybe like. I'm just imagining Jar Jar as a crime lord now. <laughs> <laughs> not a very and, you know what? One, it, it's funny that you mentioned that because um, you just a year ago. No, so where this. <laughs> a year ago, um, oh, please, I have I have bad memories of of that voice. Yeah, yeah so it a year ago, me. we were actually reading an article on um, uh, on you know like the, the 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 new novels of Star Wars that are apparently canon now, or was used to be canon, but no longer canon. But one of the stories involved with a little kid who was living in like this like small little planet that was um, the equivalent of like a, a rough neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And Jar Jar was like this uh, homeless clown who was like, um, you know, doing like performances for the kids. And the adults are saying like, no, stay away from him. And, uh, you know, they take the kid away, but the kids like the Jar Jar because he's entertaining like a little clown. But in reality, the adults say, no, stay away from him. He's dangerous because they know that he was technically the one who started the whole, you know, leading the, the you know, the, the Empire takeover and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I don't know. If the, I doubt that that story is canon or maybe it is. Uh, but I did read about that a year ago um, <laughs> when I was in a, another podcast. But no, I, I meant to say Java. I meant to say like if we're talking the the, the guys from Game of Thrones, and you know the stuff that they kind of do, I wouldn't be surprised if it involved with like uh, Jabba the Hutt and maybe like um, involving with uh, racing or battles, fighting to the death, a lot of slaves. Oh, I God. wouldn't be surprised. Morgan Wellborn says Jar Jar is Pennywise, and I'm just thinking like Pennywise mm. in the 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 sewer, and I'm thinking Jar Jar in the underwater city. You sir, come <laughs> down here, sir. We all float, sir. <laughs> float, sir, too. Also, Decker's fanfic theory about uh, kinky Jawa sex will finally come true. Oh. Oh. <laughs> that sounds like the beginning of a like a, like a fan spinoff uh, uh, movie series. Yeah. yeah. Um, there, if you want to go for more of the political sense, like you know they do with the Game of Thrones, then maybe we can focus on. Like, uh, similar to how uh, 
you know, some movies of Star Wars or some of the novels, they focus on the political stuff. There could be that. Um, Episode one and two were pretty heavily focused on the uh, Senate and the Jedi Council and all the politics and talking with that, mm -hmm. which bored me. But, it, you know, it, it did have it, it. It's there. It's established in Star Wars. OK, well. Maybe not that. Um, oh, um, actually, somebody well, actually. There's just... different ways of doing politics. There's the Game of Thrones way of doing politics. Yeah, there's the Game of Thrones I mean, way. Of doing politics. The, the thing with the the Star, the Star Wars versus Game of Thrones political scenes. It's like Game of Thrones. You got people using co co uh, creative language in Game of Thrones to effectively threaten each other's lives. Occasionally, try to throw a table or two. You know, whatever happens, happens. Star mm -hmm. Wars politics. Everyone's just sat around a table, like, yeah. Sounds like a plan. No, I can't do yeah. that. Yeah. Send um, the Jedi. Yeah. Don't send uh, the maybe, Jedi. Well, maybe they'll uh, maybe they'll make a spin-off of um let's see, Boba Fett. Uh, because I know that oh. there is gonna be a spin-off of um, Obi-Wan Kenobi coming out really soon. Yeah. So mm -hmm. maybe they'll do one on Boba Fett. And there's also Han Solo getting a solo movie. That is correct. Or a Han, Han That's Solo true. as well. I don't know. That's true. Oh. Um or or maybe um, the likes of, um, you know, uh, oh, somebody even mentioned about, like, why don't you do one based off of, um, let's see, uh, one of the video games. Uh, yeah, I think that would be the case if they were canon. But when Disney bought the rights, a lot of the movies, uh, a lot of the video games that came out, like, before the buyout, I don't think they're canon anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot, pretty much most, there was sort of just sort of a, de sort of a, sort of a, sort of a declarer, sort of a ration, sort of a. That just kind of went out from on high at Disney. They like, hey, that expanded universe you love so more so much, doesn't count anymore. It's starting over. Yeah, they're starting over, which is a shame. Yeah. Because a lot of people is. love, um, you know, the old Republic games or you know the um, Couture, as they say. Mm -hmm. Knights of the Old Republic. I do remember reading a lot of Star Wars books when I was in high school. So it is a little bit of a burn for me to think that you know that those aren't canon anymore. But I'm like. Eh, I mean, you know, lots of things have changed in the Marvel Universe. They've got so many multiverses now that they had to do their own days of future past. But eh, I can still go back and appreciate them. The, you know, the way, if I feel like it, the ones that appealed to me. Sure. That, that's uh, very valid. Mm -hmm. Oh, but, uh, oh yeah, there's a movie coming out two days from now. Ah, uh, yes. So uh, now we're going into the animes because, you know... A lot of people love anime, so yes, we are, right. there's been a lot of talks of live-action anime over the past couple of years. In the next two days, as of the making of this uh, live stream, we're getting a live-action Full Metal Alchemist movie, and it's going to be coming out in the next two days, and we already have a new trailer for it. So yeah, um, I actually am a huge fan of Full Metal Alchemist, uh, especially Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. I've uh, watched it a lot when I was in college, uh, when um, Toonami was being um, was airing them at the time, and then eventually I saw uh, the the animated movies uh, where uh, you know where, where apparently when uh, you know uh, what was it Edward went back to World War II and he was interacting with our world and yeah mm -hmm. that was it's it's. Uh, it's interesting but yeah brotherhood is a great um basically uh taking of what the manga was and adapting it so uh, I, I absolutely love that um so yeah um you know it's, it's basically um the case in which we are getting a lot more live action anime movies uh, evangelion uh death note had the netflix series um attack on titan had one so yeah um, I'm actually really curious what your thoughts are on this. So I've I have been not seen Full Metal Alchemist yet. I've been into anime since uh, I started college, but um, I I got into Full Metal Alchemist the first series after college, and then I saw uh, Brotherhood. I think it was in 2000. 10 something yeah, like that when i finally yeah, like, I watched it but uh it was you know like i definitely i ended up liking brotherhood i liked the beginning of the original better but i liked brotherhood more as a whole and uh i'm not really sure i i have to admit i'm a little bit i i'm 
I hate to be that person, but I'm not really sure that this is the right move because I have seen live action adaptations of anime before, and a lot of them are questionable at best. And I do know that Decker has watched at least one with me, and that, of course, is Cutie Honey, the live action movie from 2004. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, Not to mention, yeah. you guys did also watch Dragon Ball Evolution. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so, I mean, like, uh, this has not had, I would say, an exactly successful, you know, history to it so far. Mm -hmm. So, I, when I see that they're making a live-action anime, there is a fanboy inside of me that stands up and roars, No! But <sighs> I can say that the worst thing that might come of it is that I just don't watch it. You know, I... It's perfectly I, fair. Nerdbane says yeah. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Diamond is, is forever got a live action movie. It's good, but not something you'd want to introduce newcomers to the series. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, uh, if I can ch just chime in, I, you know, I honestly have not seen Full Metal Alchemist, but I did s uh, watch a number of trailers. I did a little little prep for our show. That's why I have all these obscure comments. Um, but there's something that's been in game music. Uh, that I'm hoping that it's going to evolve out of. There's a there's a classical composer. His name is Carl Orff. He wrote uh, the famous Carmina Burana and Carmina Cthulhu, which ah. is if you listen to it, it's like oh, this is what everyone's copying. At some point, it became kind of like the standard, where it's like when you see a video game, especially if it's an epic one, it's got to be this kind of music. And boy, am I ready for an evolution out of that into something mm -hmm. else. I'm hoping I, that- I, I remember having O Fortuna, like yeah. <laughs> as a kid, just having the, the right. CD. I remember yes. like the, the startup of uh, Dracula on Sega CD is playing right. Karina Barana. Right. And it's like, I'm waiting for the, um, hopefully it's soon. I, I, I'm a very good colleague of mine, um, Austin Wintery who's uh, done n numerous games. He's done one of the Sa Assassin's Creed. It's so great to hear. He, he has actual developmental, interesting music, interesting ideas, and they haven't temp-tracked it with anything. And, and of course, Bear has done uh, uh, games and other people. Bear McCreary has done games where we're kind of like growing out of this phase, you know, where we can look back and say, okay, the, the uh, very late 90s and the... T t 2000s and 2010s had that sound now this is what's going into 2020 you know hopefully there's a delineation soon it, my two cents that's all I'm start, because i thought it was a cool. big epic oh, yeah. fantasy I just game had a, just had a little there's other ways to do epic head. other than carl orff is what i'm <laughs> talking about music and like the evolution thereof a little thing a thought popped into my head completely unplanned but it's not like hey you have a composer here live in front of 100 people and i could be i could ask you anything i want yes you, you can. can unplug your computer and run away but no still, I, I, I never shy away from a from a opinion from a time. Question. Okay, yes. Dubstep. Dubstep. Okay. Uh love dubstep in dance music, uh overused to the hilt in movie trailers and in movies themselves. If I hear one more you know, and I thought I thought it was the coolest thing in two thousand nine. And then in two thousand eleven I'm going, uh, you're still doing that? Can you find <laughs> something else? <laughs> you know, and it's like, and when when um, I, I I just worked on a like a a, 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 a neo film noir movie, right? And it was mm -hmm. temp tracked with some music that I, I had to tell the people. I said, "Listen, this no one's doing this anymore. This is like we're in 2018, going into 2019. This is like." kind of like 2007 can we do we need to go this direction and luckily we did that you know they said okay let's let's run it by us you know because it worked for them and they felt good with it it made the cuts work it was great yeah but you can't but dubstep uh, i loved like i said love dubstep in in dance music and in 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 music pure music for like going to concerts and what have you but uh, it, i think it's run its course in in using it, it being in scoring music it gets me i i haven't used the word cliche yet so anyway so that's my that's my opinion
So if you have another one, go go right ahead. Ask me. You want to you want to know what plugins I use and all that sort of stuff? I'll be happy to tell you. Yeah, that's just that's just a random thing that popped in my mind. I was like, well, that's I, good. That's, that's, that's the one thing I always thought. It's like when I was growing up, I was thinking. People always say that they like this genre, don't like that genre, but I mm -hmm. see joy in every genre. And mm -hmm. I don't believe there will ever be a genre of music that I just detest. And then someone had to go and invent dubstep. <laughs> <laughs> and then they put it in everything. And then you're yeah. confronted with it, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I like techno, so there's things in dubstep that I can, you know, I can get behind. But then it's just... Mm -hmm so much everywhere it was like stop well i've been i've me personally i've been exploring uh, i discovered uh well a few other people have discovered too uh you know uh, uh there's an instrument that was designed uh, by the leonardo da vinci and it was basically if you can imagine a harpsichord <clears throat> and instead of like when you play the keyboard a hammer hits the strings you are pedaling these these cylinders that have um uh, like a violin bow on it throughout the entire keyboard. So every time you play, and it's like this very interesting, stringy, uh, unearth unearthly, angelic instrumental sound. And it's called uh, the viola organista. And they never built it. It was a conceptual idea that um, Leonardo da Vinci came up with. And he had drawings. He haven't actually had schematics of the design. Someone had built it in the city of Cremona, Italy which is like uh, north of Rome, which is uh, Cremona is also famous for the creation of the uh, Stradivarius violin. Stradivari lived there. And uh, it's a, just a gorgeous instrument. And so I've been using it a lot. And it, it just it, it's very versatile in, in creating atmosphere and moods. It can be melodic. It can be very creepy sounding. It can be very, uh, it just, it, it, as simple as that instrument is, it just has a wide uh um, breath of uh, of uh, expression, and uh, as you know, Bear McCreary he has all kinds of crazy stuff. Danny Elfman has he loves percussive tonal instruments. I think he has like one of the biggest uh, marimba and xylophone <laughs> collections <laughs> that anyone could have. But um, but yeah, that's what we're all doing. The guys, most of the guys, were trying to look for something that's not going to become cliche and that and that's what keeps us on our game is that you know you're you're I, I you know i don't i don't want to do this i mean i did stuff early in my career that was successful i couldn't even dream of doing it again i mean i listen to that and i go wow that's a different person you know <laughs> if i had to do it yeah i would know how to do it but it's like okay that's the way i did things back then and i just can't play you know it's really sad there are some people that you know they have they have a way of doing things and they don't stop that way of doing things, you know, um, where it's different where, where, for instance, like uh, what I really admire about John Williams is that he just constantly raises the bar. Yes, it's always with a big orchestra. It's always with grand, gorgeous music, but there's something different that he does every time, you know, so. And on the topic of uh, kind of uh, unique, otherworldly sounds from mm -hmm. instruments, I, I'm just remembering one that I heard of ages ago mm -hmm. and and just sort of saw a little bit of documentation on it, a little documentary thingy a jig i think it was invented by benjamin franklin okay uh the concept was the same as you have your wine glasses they're filled of a certain amount oh, of wine yes. each other, rubbing your fingers on the edge and making a tone but this Absolutely. is just discs, uh, like cups of glass aligned mm -hmm. on to effectively a cylinder sort of mm -hmm. thing and you have it oil on it, a very messy instrument. Mm -hmm. Well, and, it's called the glass heart. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah as, as far as I know, it's like you kind of work your fingers as you're spinning it with, I think, a pedal, and it produced a very unique sound, and it actually kind of took off for a bit, mm -hmm. but when they manufactured it, there was a lot of lead used, and so oh, wow. a lot of people who used it got very ill, that's and incredible. That's they, awful. they thought it was the sounds, the, the, the very unique noises it made that was causing people to get ill. So it fell out of favor soon after. Well, o Mozart in his repertory uses the glass harp and it's a it's a very quiet instrument. Um, there's actually I, I never knew that it, it, it used to bathe in oil. Uh, it, you know how the concept you can get a, a fine white crystal wine glass and you can wet it and put your finger over it. You, you start to, the friction of your finger in the water starts to create a vibration and a tone that resonates through that 
through that uh, the, the bulb of of the uh, the wine glass. So what they did is they turned it over on their side, put a uh, a cylinder in the middle and it rolls and it kind of like as it rolls it rolls in water so it's constantly bathing itself ah. and you can actually tell with the you, the the person that's playing it has to dry their finger every once in a while to create the friction because if you don't have any friction there's not going to be any sound if there's too much space between if, if the water creates too much of if it your finger hydroplanes you're just not going to get any sound so it's a very 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 delicate sound and i, I might have uh, got it wrong about the oil then I yeah, know. I mean, Memory but funny you know, it could thing. have been made of lead glass. Who knows? You know, there could have been lead in the too much lead in the crystal for for some reason. But yeah, I think um, uh, um, Benjamin Franklin did a, a different take on that design. But it was widely used in Europe. But it's something that's very quiet and very delicate. And I've I, I've actually used it last year on, on a score, uh, but not a real one. Obviously, they have a a virtual instrument that's uh, much more convenient to yeah, use. Mem Memory is a funny thing. Is I'm just remembering something from uh, Killer Clowns. Uh, when I went to review it, because I'd seen it like before when I was about eight years old, and uh -huh. it scared the crap out of me. Mm -hmm. And there was one scene that I vividly remembered, and I was like, that's going to be really freaky when we get to that. And we got to that scene, and it wasn't as nearly as freaky as I remembered it. Imagine that. <laughs> like the part where they, 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 get, they're in the, they got all the cotton candy cocoons. Right. She's there like, people do not store cotton candy like this. And Mike Tobacco's like, yeah, sure, they always do. Look. And he just pulls off the piece and, and there's the face. the face under <laughs> it. When I was a kid, I could have sworn that that was like dark and there's a chunk of blood that came with the cotton candy. And it was very uh -huh. wet, bloody, gory, kind of horrifying. Right. That's right. how I remembered it. Right, right. But then well, I see it and it's like, hey, plastic face. Yeah, uh -huh. of course you're an adult now. But uh, the guy who did the uh, all the uh, sound design for that, um, uh, Chuck Serino, he, he's also a composer and uh, a pal of mine. And um, so, so yeah, he, there's like there's a sound of like, you know, I don't know, I can't do it, but there's a sound that grows. It's very effective. It grosses you out, you know, like ripping off a layer of skin or something like that, right? Um, but uh, that I mean, it's so fu it's so funny because. I think you're the age of one of my nephews. And when he was around, when he saw it for the first time, I think he was like, like seven or eight. And he said, Uncle Johnny, is this, my mom says it's a scary movie. And I told him, Tony, I think it's, I think it's more weird than scary. But if you want to wait until you're like 11 or 13, because it's a, it is a PG 13 movie. Right. Uh -huh. So actually he waited till he was like 12 and he saw it. He said, and he called, and of course, you know, he wasn't a tiny little boy anymore. He was, he had a deeper voice and he says, uncle Johnny, it wasn't, uh, apparently it wasn't as scary as I thought, but you're right. It is pretty damn weird. So <laughs> right, that's, that's what makes it it's scary and weird and funny. It has all those, it has that little trifecta of, uh, of a right. formula that makes it work. And, and, and I think that's why it's become kind of like about kind of, part of america americana culture because it does follow the, the formula of like the blob and other monster movies because the the kyoto brothers that created this they grew up on monster movies they love right. that stuff they couldn't have hired the better the a better team of people to make a picture like that you did say um you talked about like you and decker both were talking about how he were you remember something as being terrifying mm -hmm. from when you were younger and as right. an adult, it, you perceive it differently. It's yeah. it's it may be different from how you remember it, or it can be the same, but it doesn't affect you the same way that it did. And mm -hmm. uh, this actually ties into an earlier conversation, a topic that we had mm -hmm. that I remained pretty quiet on, mm -hmm. and I feel like I should uh, explain why we were Please. talking about the possibility that there was going to be a child's play TV series. I'm going uh -huh. to reveal something that I'm not especially proud of. Okay. <laughs> Those movies scare the shit out of me to this fucking day. <laughs> <laughs> even even now. <laughs> even now. Okay. Like, you know, like, this is something that I, I don't like to brag about. But I'm right. like, to this day, just the face of, of Chucky will freak right. me out. And it's right. like, and I've wondered for a long time why that is. Mm-hmm. And I've narrowed it down to two things. Mm -hmm. One, I think a part of it is the uncanny valley effect. It looks just human enough to where your brain can put it in the somewhat human category. But at the right. same time, there's that artificial plastic 
wrongness that just is really unsettling and really disturbing. And I feel like, I actually feel like the classic movies before they started mm-hmm. using CGI, you know, right. when it was an actual puppeteer, when it was puppeteer right. work to do it. That is actually the scarier thing to me than with just the CGI. Well, I think th- I think there's an archetype in there that goes back to some kind of uh, 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 folklore that mm. is uh, it, it, it's it's very visceral and very deep and very primordial. That mm-hmm. to see something that looks resembles a person, like uh, some edifice of any you know, a, like a statue or anything like that, and all of a sudden it comes alive. Right. You know. And- and the concept isn't new. I mean, this wasn't mm-hmm. something, this wasn't no. a brand new concept that was invented in the 80s. The the folklore, the mythos of a human effigy, you know, right. that is given sentience and brought to life, whether for good or ill, whether it, you know, is right. you know, like, I mean, there are different takes on this idea, you uh-huh. know, where uh, the effigy comes alive and the person who crafted it falls in love with it, or the uh-huh. effigy comes alive and the person takes on a, and the crafter takes on a more parental role, like with Pinocchio, the story of Pinocchio, yes. or yes. in the case of the child's play movies where it right. comes alive and becomes a thing to be fear becomes uh, something that is dangerous and is a threat to your child or something or and to adults as well right. and you know but it's it is something that i still find unsettling to this day and yes. i am ve- especially afraid to say this right now because i have this horrible feeling that one day i'm going to get a call from decker and he's going to <laughs> reveal that he is doing the summer of chucky and i am going to get dragged into both watching <laughs> and helping to review these movies because right. that is exactly the sort of thing that decker would do to me <laughs> well you know you bring up an ex- excellent uh, example of pinocchio it, it's like the it's that archetype in reverse someone creates a human like puppet but he Geppetto, the uh, the archetype of the the best father that there is, the unconditional love, um, mm-hmm. creates his son, and terrifying things happen to his son that are terrifying for him. The mm-hmm. worst things in the world are happening sure. to his little boy, you know. And it's like, and with Chucky, it's the other way around. Right. He makes the worst things in the world happen. To other I people. did remember reading once uh-huh. that the original, the 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 I forget his name, and and I apologize right now for doing that. But mm-hmm. the screenplay writer, the person who conceived the early movies, uh huh. The this the concept for the movie came about because of an idea he had about uh-huh. commercialism and and modern media of you know during the 80s you know right, but what was right. then modern media and commercialism the right. idea of those things having a negative impact on mm-hmm. children specifically mm-hmm. you know a an impressionable child and right. that the original script right. was left it much more ambiguous for a longer period of time about whether the child was just disturbed in some way and you know was actually mm-hmm. going around killing people or whether it was the doll who was doing it or if it was right. the doll influencing the child to commit murder so yes. there was a lot more ambiguity to the original concept than the finished project but that mm-hmm. that element is, was was much more prevalent in the movie you know but um so i guess i, w- I wouldn't recommend the movie the boy to you there was one that was like someone had they had this like uh, almost like um, a puppet of a boy that a girl had to babysit and you have to do things with him because his like soul was in it that was terrifying i i haven't even seen the movie. i i saw that i saw the trailer for that and yeah that triggered a couple of right? negative flashbacks yeah. yeah no i think it's one of the archetypes that uh, uh that creators of the horror genre zone in on right you know it um, is and if you look at stories if you study stories and i have i can't say that i have a professional degree in this but you know mm-hmm. i do write and i uh-huh. i have studied you know there are if you look at stories there are themes there are archetypes the mm-hmm. the 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 ill girl the right. classic hero the mm-hmm. um damsel in distress everybody mm-hmm. knows that one mm-hmm. or the the lonely child all of these mm-hmm. are, are these archetypes and these types of stories that fit in to with these archetypes they have existed for thousands of years but they still yeah. resonate with people and this you know the 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 insole doll or the soulless doll that is 
emulating human behavior, you know, that is a, an archetype and right. it does lend itself really, really effectively for some reason to the horror genre. You know, it yeah. is and, something... and look at, look at the puppet master series. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's exactly all. Yeah. Bring, those are actually the manifestations of someone's uh, he, he either like creates a soul and puts it in the, the puppets or they he transfers like someone dies and he's able to transfer their soul into this inanimate objects, which then becomes real. Right. So, and uh, I actually have a funny story to go with the this whole thing mm -hmm. uh, very quickly because I can see that look on Decker's face and I know what it means. <laughs> 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 but um uh, i had a nightmare about chucky way mm -hmm. back in i want to say it was, it was either 09 or it was two it was it was 09 way way back in 09 almost 10 years ago but i remember this mm -hmm. vividly i had a nightmare where chucky the doll and his girlfriend tiffany drag chained me up and set me down in front somehow you know set me down in front of a typewriter and told me they wanted me to write a screenplay for a new movie starring them that would make people afraid of them again and uh -huh. i was sitting and, and this is a dream so it operates on dream logic but i'm sitting there and i'm like no i hated your movies go away i don't mm -hmm. want to do this i refuse <laughs> to do this stop it <laughs> and you know you may become a if you can deal with those fears and man and, and and realize them on the page you may have a, mm -hmm. the beginning of a great story outline well the funny but thing about who it says is it that has to be who has says it has to be the chucky franchise yeah. it could be your yeah. franchise yeah, but the funny Lord. thing about it is that a couple of years later, Curse of Chucky came out, and that was the movie that people, that critics said it was the movie that made the character scary for them again. <laughs> well, well, you know, the m most uh, uh, the most like, successful stories uh, are, are are come from personal. Um, whether uh, personal triumph or personal fears is that they get it out. I think Ray Bradbury used to talk about it all the time. He says, I just, I just wrote about things that terrified me. You know, mm -hmm. if you ever read any of his short stories, he has one called the skeleton. Uh, and it came from going to the doctor one day and uh, he thought he had a sore throat. He says, no, you don't have a sore throat. It's probably just uh, irritated. It's not a sore throat. And I go, well, why can't I get my mind out of it? Because you're obsessed by it. You won't let it go. You just have to forget about it. I mean, there's some people that are obsessed with their feet. They don't like the way their feet look, so they're constantly covering them. You know, it's I knew a woman who was like that. So perfect, yeah. <laughs> perfectly normal. So that's what he wrote. He wrote the short story, The Skeleton, a guy who was convinced that his skeleton was a, another creature living within his body. At one day, one day it will leave, and he'll be nothing but a blob. You know, mm -hmm. and so it was his paranoia. And so, so all, all I'm saying is that, like, he took that fear. Or that right. obsession and turned it into a story. So I do agree with you, though. Yeah. Though you know, the, these personal fears that yeah that dig into you and stay with you do make for effective horror. And you can finally, find Decker, you may speak. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so topic. Decker, you're going to show. You're going to do a a dramatic recreation of of Creepy's story that, that you guys <laughs> worked out. Right? Is that what you're going to do? Uh, no. I was going to go for the other. Uh, there was still one more piece of news that we still haven't te technically gotten to, and we've been going. We've been live for like two Too hours long. and twenty minutes. Yeah. Yes. So this because is someone's going to need a bathroom break before too long. <laughs> a long episode. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there's on the topic of like Pinocchio and the happy little kids and Disney c cartoon stuff. Hey, Kingdom Hearts three had okay. a new yeah. gameplay trailer shown off in Japan. Uh -huh. Right, and it and revealed in Japan. They, they it revealed uh, Monsters Incorporated world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I will say that Kingdom Hearts, since given our guest of honor tonight, I will say that this is another game where music is used to enhance the story and help carry the story very, mm -hmm. very well. You know, it is a very. I, I admit that when I first saw the commercials for Kingdom Hearts way, way back in 2002, in late 2002, I was incredibly skeptical. This may seem kind of strange, but like in the 8 bit and 16 bit era and the early, you know, 32 bit era, Disney games did not have the best rep reputation. So, as I, you know, as I remember, Disney games were beautiful very well crafted you know artistically 
And then when he got down to the gameplay, they were so balls hard. Yeah, or just awful. You know, just, just and terrible. And most games. of them on mo- weren't most of them online. Uh, w- weren't there like you had to log in t- to like a, a particular? I'm I'm thinking around 2006, 2007. I'm, yeah. I'm thinking of like early '90s with like yeah, the Lion King great. on Sega Genesis. I All could right. not get past. I just can't wait to be king. That mm-hmm. level would just tear me up. And I wanted to play as a grown-up Simba, where you can actually attack stuff and not just go. Eh. But I couldn't get that far because the game was too t- difficult. Right. Yeah, they did it on purpose. Actually, yeah. if you've ever seen uh, interviews by the guy who developed uh, the game, he was talking about like the reason why they had to make that level difficult was because they didn't want people to return, um, you know, the game from blockbuster rentals. So they decided to make the game hard on purpose so that they can be able to keep it. Right. Um, you know, they kept renting it for more times than just one. Uh. <laughs> But yeah, like Kingdom Hearts is a game that has really, really good, really effective music. So I am that you know, just on that note, right. considering who's with us tonight, I, yeah. I that's good news. Well, yeah. yes, uh, you know, I'm actually surprised that out of all the, I mean, they, they were talking about levels for Kingdom Hearts three for the longest time, and now we actually, I mean, we've actually have confirmed that they're doing Tangled, they're doing wow. Frozen, they might be doing Big Hero six, but as of this new trailer, they're doing Monsters Inc., which is actually surprising to me because if you guys remember from Kingdom Hearts two, they were going to have the Toy Story characters in the game, but they decided to scrap that. So, yeah, I'm actually really surprised out of all of the Pixar movies that we've had, Monsters, Inc. is definitely going to be uh, showcased in this game. Mm-hmm. I saw uh, the Toy Story characters in the trailer as well. Yes. Yeah, there were, there were all the Toy Story characters. and uh, I, I love that it's a Japanese trailer and you hear, <laughs> you hear Buzz Lightyear <laughs> screaming in Japanese. Yeah, it's really <laughs> odd because yeah, he sounds like the sensei. And the, the composer for Kingdom Hearts 3 is Yoko Shimomura. Shimomura. Shimomura, who has quite a, uh, you know, he's a Final Fantasy uh, 15, uh, uh, Chikara. You're obviously familiar with him. Um, John Tron. You're familiar, these are movies that he's done also. He's quite, uh, he's quite uh, uh, prolific. So, um, so you guys should look that up. Yeah, it should, should be really interesting. Uh, you know, we've been waiting for Kingdom Hearts for the longest time. Mm-hmm. The, the the last numbered Kingdom Hearts game was in two thousand five, and we've had a lot of spinoffs since then. But mm-hmm. um, now we actually have a numerical one, and we've had all these trailers about all these new worlds, all the new mechanics, right. but we still don't have a release date. Yeah. And D D twenty three out here is coming out relatively soon. Is it is it next month? I think it is because we usually uh, go, I usually I usually go. Uh, yeah, I think that is coming fun. next month, and I, I'm really looking forward to all the stuff that is announced in D twenty three. The likes of maybe the Wreck It Ralph sequel, mm-hmm. uh, and also uh, let's see, maybe the um, Pixar's um, newest movie, The Incredibles two. We've already had a trailer of it. Um, a few days ago on Wednesday uh, when the Olympics was uh, on and we did see what the trailer is going to be focusing on. It's actually going to be focusing on Elastigirl, which, I, which I'm actually looking forward to. Mm-hmm. Uh, Very much so. Let's see. Uh, Disney's newest movie. Um, that is the yeah, wreck and Ralph 2, I'm sorry. Uh, there's that. Um, probably something along the lines with Marvel or Star Wars or maybe some upcoming TV shows. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm um, I'm actually looking forward to it, um, you know, to see what's to come. Mm-hmm. Also, one more little p- bit of news. I got a message on my Facebook, but it, I'm th- not thinking that it's really too solid. But I was told, hey, Return of the Killer Clowns from Outer Space in 3D has been confirmed by IMDb to be coming in 2018. And I'm thinking IMDb doesn't, that's not a confirmation. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> if you have the right account, you can put lots of stuff on IMDb. Right. And uh, that's an IMDb thought. was my source when I first said that the Jeepers Creepers 3 was coming in 2015, I think I said, but you know, that came and went and there was still no Jeepers Creepers 3. I can and only it was say this. Several years. I can only say this. 
and I can say no else. After I say what I'm going to say, I can't say anything else. Uh, the source for the uh, the um, <clears throat> the IMDb is, is very reliable and, and is legitimate. It's uh, just that uh, it's basically uh, still in the works. That's all I can say. Okay, That's fantastic. It. So yeah. I'm thinking it might be something along the lines of like with Jeepers Creepers 3 where I saw an IMDb and said, hey, it's coming. And it had the year and the year wasn't very accurate. But eventually we did get Jeepers Creepers 3. Yeah. Right. Well, I was at the Kyoto Brothers studio the other day shooting uh, just some pictures of me with the props for, for various articles that, uh, you know, my story is going to be in regarding the concert. And um, they were on the phone with someone. Who I can't say they were on the phone with. And after they got off the phone, I go, "How did it go?" And they said, eh, "It's still in the works." So, but they <laughs> they told me a little bit more than that. I can't say anything else. Oh, let, let me say it doesn't fall on deaf ears that uh, people are asking for a sequel of some sort or a continuation of the story arc mm -hmm. uh, because it's it's a part of sci-fi fantasy horror that's so bizarre that no one's really, um, you know. It was like one of the first things that, that is so absolutely bizarre that hasn't been followed up on. I mean, you have you name the franchise. It's got a sequel. This <laughs> one hasn't. And there's actually a reason why, but I can't even I can't tell you. I probably can tell you in 75 years, or maybe I'll put it in a, <laughs> put it maybe I'll put it in a uh, like a time capsule. But it's like I just gotta like ring. Uh, and I have a legitimate license from MGM that I purchased to put on this concert. So I, they, you know, there's all sorts of conditions and I got to really respect those conditions. I wish I could talk like, Absolutely. you know, I wish I could, I, I wish I can pontificate like, uh, you know, so we, all, we all understand how non-disclosure agreements work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, I've never been on the business. I've never ever been on the business end. I've got my I got my ass chewed out, but I've never been on the business end of a lawsuit or anything like that in, during keep my that street going. Keep that during keep my that. career, and I, and I'm probably old enough to be some of your guys' older uncle or grandfather. So I am very proud of that. Um, <laughs> so, anyways, but I, all I could just tell you uh, to quote uh, 2010. What is that when they go, uh, it's full of stars and they say, you know. And, uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Yes, 2001 A Space or 2010? 2001 A Space Odyssey. 2001 A Space Odyssey. He says, uh, he says everything is going to be wonderful. What is it? What is it? It's wonderful. You know, the change that's going to be happening. Oh, when uh, Io becomes uh, a plant, uh, uh, has life on, developing it and Jupiter becomes a sun. You know, mm -hmm. the it's like that was one of the things that's all i could say that's a really obscure reference i'm sorry <laughs> for those of you that didn't get it but uh that's a heady sci-fi reference but uh anyway so that's about all i could say the the i will say that the Kyoto brothers now they are so busy uh creating all kinds of the, what they're known for uh, practical effects uh puppetry realistic um uh, living props and what have you. And uh, I always tell people it's kind of like going to skunk works, you know, at Northrop, you know, there, you can't talk, they can't ever talk about what they're working on until it's way released. And then they can like talk about it. You know, they, but the, no one can like, they can't put on Facebook, Hey, we're working on this. I mean, they're, they're working for two very large non MGM, um, uh, friend brands, uh, or, or, or corporations on just some really wonderful stuff, but they can't talk about it until it's way out, w way out, like when it's finished and released, then they can like they talk about it. They can just tell right. other people, they, they, but that's just the way it is, you know? Ah, uh, yeah. That's also the, the nature of the, we've beast. been going for two and a half hours. Yeah. And, and I, I know just, why I know why probably about time to start winding down and ending the show. And the best way to end the show is to have everyone, Mention exactly what it is they are working on. Okay. In detail. <laughs> so. In less than 12 seconds. <laughs> ah. Yeah. So, uh, on the gaming channel, I got the Doki Doki Literature Club videos up to the ending of the uh, story up. And I think I'm going to go back and talk with the one lady that I didn't talk to too much on the first playthrough because... 
they didn't seem like they did anything wrong. And I, I'd, I'd like to see what the, the goes like. Usually with the visual novels, I go back and I talk with the other ladies, but this time I'm, I'm scared to because everything's very scary. And there's a lot of foreshadowing early once you actually play through it and they start talking about all this stuff. You realize just how much foreshadowing was in it the whole time. Mm. Uh, still got the uh, live streams going in the gaming channel. It's cut back from every two days to every four, because I really am trying to catch up on the reviews on the main channel. Started the Phantasm 4 Oblivion review script today. Going to continue that tonight. Having a lot of fun watching that Phantasm series and trying to figure out still what is even going on four movies in. I still have no idea. <laughs> well, I have to ask you a question, Decker, because I, I really admire uh, how, how your channel has flourished o over the years uh are you find yourself at a point where you're basically going uh, youtube content full time uh technically i started doing youtube content as just my only job on the first year because i was moving and i had that opportunity mm -hmm. so i was like this it sounds like something i'd like to try and i probably only have six months to get it to work and make it but I'm yeah. I'm going for it. Good for Fortunately, you. it turned out that I didn't absolutely have to do that, and I actually had a bigger opportunity to keep at it full time than I thought. Uh, but still, I just have been pushing for that, and I, it's really it's it's the kind of job that I've had that is the best job I've ever had. I'm a high school dropout, so my options mm -hmm. are kind of hey, would you like to stock groceries here or stock groceries there? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can flip burgers if you like, and none of them really appeal to me. It's it's yeah. it's very dr soul draining kind of work to be like I have to get up and go and do that, and being able to just you know, speak my mind about movies and games and stuff. It's a very it's a very liberating kind of experience, mm -hmm. and I really enjoy that it's been working out, and I can actually focus on this and yeah. like the beginning of 2018 has been going as well as it has for instance the fourth episode of my new live show i got a well-known awesome composer on it's, it's amazing and hey with uh, with a two weeks notice i could have gotten some other people to be with me we could have had a really awesome panel we could have had potentially the kyoto brothers they love doing stuff like this oh. so perhaps maybe in a, some other show down the line we, well, this, we this show is every two weeks yeah, so we don't enough. have to do it next week. We could do like episode uh, seven could be, uh, you know, let a little, little time go by. Just about uh, about a month later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we can, <laughs> you know, too. I mean, if you're really serious about it, get in touch with me. And, and maybe, maybe I, if they're in town, maybe we can get some uh, members of the Dickies to do a quickie, quickie uh, check in. Uh, that would be awesome. Yeah, but, that yeah. Would so that's that's what I've been working on. The Phantasm review still trying to. I got uh -huh. the ones that were supposed to be on Dino Sember at the end of last year. I'm still going to do the dinosaur movie reviews. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to be December, so I don't know what to call it. Oh, we love the dinosaurs. Yeah. We love. It. Is it going to be the summer of dinosaurs? Even though it's the spring. <laughs> that that'd be that'd be something. But yeah. I got a I got a big summer special plan this year. Not as huge as the summer of Freddy vs Jason, but mm -hmm. a big request. Mm -hmm. So there's and that. So we're going to hear what's creepy doing. Uh, I got the I got my latest uh, X Men retrospective uh, review up. I mm -hmm. am going to be reviewing the last two episodes of the first volume of the Batman animated series, mm -hmm. uh, Mad as a Hatter and Dreams in Darkness, both of which were very popular episodes of that show. Mm -hmm. They were very dark and very psychological. So those are coming up soon. Awesome! Awesome. And, uh, and uh, as for me, I just posted up a new episode of my podcast, uh, We're In Between. I got in voice actor Der David Jeremiah as a guest. Awesome. And um, got some other stuff coming. That's good. And uh, that's very, very good. I, lo I love podcasts because it's like, it's, to me, it's like, it's, like the, it's like classic radio, what radio kind of used to be. Mm -hmm. and, and it would be really cool. What I used to really dig, there was a time where I, I had uh, done other things besides music. And what I really loved is on AM radio, they had old time radio shows mm -hmm. and they were just absolutely captivating. I mean, yeah. just, just like, and so from like nine o'clock at night to one in the morning, uh, it, it really kept my spirits up and really uh, was really great. And it would be neat to see podcasts that were just literally like radio dramas that pe mm -hmm. people can tune in, put on their earbuds, 
and check out their podcast and keep up with a story you know yeah. and it could be a terrifying story maybe about like dolls that are telling some guy to write a story and he, <laughs> he has to write it or he might die if he doesn't finish a chapter at the end of the day you know uh, so, scary enough to get but that, that's fascinating uh, that's fascinating but no one finds them scary because they're just little dolls and they're cheesy mm -hmm. and no one's gonna believe that <laughs> in the meantime so, they're threatening your life so patricia will you will you, will you send me the um uh, your link to your podcast. Uh, Hello, she there. Hello, did we lose We're her? Kind of off and on, but yeah. oh well. Oh well, I'll 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 have her do it. And you want me to wrap up real quick? And are you? Oh, Deck, are you going to do that thing the way you sign off on your videos? And remember, is da, 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 the da. problem with that is I, that's whenever I'm scripting, that's the part that I sit there for like two hours trying to figure out what to say. Those are good. <laughs> so Those I, are I, I end up saying good. it out of habit, trying to yeah. say something, and I always get to. And remember, and then it's just like, uh oh. <laughs> Th those are those are absolutely brilliant. Uh, that's that's actually that's what r I really look forward to is that punchline. And remember, when you're doing this, consider uh, and whatever that, the timing <laughs> that you have on that is absolutely perfect. Okay, you want me to just wrap up? Me, I, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it very there. quickly. Um, I I I did. My, I finished my uh, first cinematic steampunk album uh, that's uh, released by a a list mu movie trailers. I finished it, uh, last fall and I'm currently working on my second cinematic steampunk album and a Christmas album. Awesome. Yeah. So, and, and I'm doing uh, killer clowns from outer space live to film with the Hollywood chamber orchestra, special guest, the Dickies at the Montauban <laughs> theater in Hollywood and California. We're talking about Hollywood, California as in, Hollywood and Vine. I mean, it can't be more Hollywood. And it's being, the concert is on the weekend that it was originally released all those years ago. In awesome. the theaters. If the yeah. uh, event link was anything to go by, uh, if I could get to Hollywood, that, that's the expensive part. Going to oh, the concert. Not like, uh, what are you talking about? No. Yeah. Going to the concert, like front row seats. I tell if, you what, front, you, front row you, center, if they weren't already bought by now, I think they you are. You figure out how to get here and you'll have a seat. I could, I could because do that. Because who's going to do the live uh, live stream cast? I need you to do the live stream cast. Decker, we are not walking all the way to Hollywood. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> you wanted to walk? Oh, I see. It would be expensive because you would have to stop at, at all the, um, uh, oh, what do you call the, oh, the, you have those great diners. But we don't have them in California. The Waffle Houses. So you have yeah. to like, hit all the Waffle Houses. I got, I got a Waffle the... House right on the corner here. Oh man, I've missed. It's one those of the places. only things that's actually open twenty four hours around here. I, I used to live in Augusta, Georgia. I, I, I remember. That. I went. I went. I walked down to Walmart to buy myself a new three DS mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, and I showed up at like two a.m. and right. they were closed. And I'm like, you do that? <laughs> 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 so I just walked to the Waffle House and got some coffee. That's the uh, way to go. Till sunrise. Yeah, we'll figure figure out a way to, to come out, uh, Decker, and and we'll we'll uh, you know it's it's believe it or not it's not that expensive if you plan uh, plan a, a ahead of time. I mean, Orbitz has great uh, great deals, and I mean, I had a friend that he he, he went he went to Las Vegas uh, to see his uncle, and it cost like a hundred dollars round trip by plane, and uh, he he. Uh, rented a car for like twenty eight dollars, but it was all through. Or he he had just like really looked for all the best deals, and he got it. You know, so awesome. it's pot. If you want to come, you're a welcome guest. You you'd be a welcome guest out here, and uh, you know, I might I might even have you stay at my place if you can't if it if, <laughs> if, <laughs> but I, you fool I, you have no idea the but, horror but, you have but, but under one condition you have to reveal your hair care regime. So is that is that code words for I actually have to get the hair out of the plug in the shower? I can't just no. leave it there. Well, that too. I need to know how you do that. But I, I I need to know what makes your hair work. I just need to know. But I won't tell it. I will be sworn into secrecy. I won't tell anybody. So I'm I'm working on getting a nice nice uh. A nice uh merchandising deal with L'Oreal if I can. There you go. <laughs> I mean, okay, who, else, so. who else out there is saying that the, they're the internet person, the only person, internet personality with the best hair? There's nobody. Uh -huh. You're the only one. So there you go. You're branded, dude. And and number two, I'm looking at him. He's playing with his hair. <laughs> there was a day that I used to have a, a quite a head. As a matter of fact, when I did the Wonderful World of Disney thing, Michael Eisner thought I was Frank Zappa. Yeah, the, the title card for this uh, particular 
podcast after it processes and I can actually edit since I'm not allowed to do that beforehand if right. it's a scheduled event. If it's yeah. if it's just something right off the cuff going live immediately, you can on YouTube. Uh-huh. But if you schedule an event, you're not allowed to. I don't I don't get it. But yeah, the uh, little title card there. I got you. Seem to have a nice head of hair there and some pretty massive pecs. Uh-huh. Sword. It's doing it's it's push ups. That's all. It's just push ups. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I would love to see a photo of you with your former quaff. You I know, got like, it somewhere. It's, 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 I have to scan them. It's okay. like, I'd, you know. I'd, I'd love to see that. I really, I, yeah. I'm being serious. I'm not, I'm yeah. not being sarcastic. I'm being serious. I would okay. love to Watch see it. that. One. There's a movie called the wizard of speed and time that mm-hmm. I'm in. It's the only acting job I ever had. Yes, I think I've seen that movie. Yeah, well, I cannot remember anything about it, but I've seen that movie. It's bizarre as hell. Yes, I was in it. Yes, it it was. It was just. And I actually got a haircut. My hair is very long in there. It goes goes down to here, and Mm -hmm. it and it actually, I actually got a haircut for it. It was actually shorter than usual. You know. But uh, yeah, I, 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 mean, I, I apologize. I'm sorry for interrupting. I'm sorry for freaking out okay. like that. But that, that just it just kind of exploded in my head. Oh my right. god! I remember that movie. I couldn't tell yeah. you the first thing about it, but I remember it. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty bizarre little movie. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. I don't. Even, I, 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 I'm sure you were it's the on hippie YouTube. guy. Well, no, you were I, the I, hippie guy. I, no, I wasn't the hippie guy. No, no, no. I, I, I wore a suit. I wore a, a a tailored shirt and a tie. I was the guy that worked in the um, business hippie guy. It, yeah, I was oh. the guy that worked. I was the guy that worked in the the pizza uh, that had the pizza owned a piece owned a pizza shop. Uh, okay, isn't okay. that weird? Okay, I'm Italian and I own a pizza <laughs> shop. <laughs> I'm sorry for freaking out like that. I no, no, that's not right. I mean, I I have that reaction now, realizing that I was actually in it. I have the same yeah. reaction. <laughs> like, oh my god, I was in that. Wow, that was so bizarre. Yeah, and I didn't want to be in it. That's the problem. I said, listen, I've got these headshots of these guys. They're actually actors. They they. They can do boom like that. They could do this in their sleep. I have not the first thing to, the, you know, the both the director, the cinematographer, who was uh, Russ, um, um, oh gosh, Russ, not Russ Mitchell. Oh gosh, his first name is Russ. How can I forget his name? He he's the cinematographer. He's the cinematographer for Avatar. Uh, he he uh, he direct. He helped direct me also. Um, um, not Russ Mitchell. Uh, Russ Carpenter. Russell Carpenter was it was the cinematographer and if it wasn't for tips he gave me and the director gave me i i would have just completely wasted their time but <laughs> uh, i would never i would never act again it's not not in my blood to be an actor so ah so anyways so gosh uh before I we hit three hours, hours we should probably <laughs> hour mark <laughs> Thank you so, all for watching. I have been that long-haired creepy guy, and this has been Decker Shadow and our very, very, very special guest, John uh, Masari. Masari. Yes, and it's been <laughs> a pleasure hanging around with you and you too, uh, Miss Mar- Miranda. Very Thank musical you very name. much. Very musical Thank name. You. you know, it's actually funny. I've never actually told this to anybody before. Huh? <laughs> and things. Um. Yeah, sorry, but yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, you're very welcome. But it, it, it just it, you have a, it's a very uh, musical name, Patricia Miranda. It yeah, sounds I've like always a, said so too. It was a wonderful. It's name. it's a, it's almost sounds like a, a line of perfume or something like that. <laughs> something really sophisticated, you know. Or like if you want to, do, you know, do a or or a designer line of clothing or something like that. Anyways, all and right. Remember, I like that actually. And remember. Killer Clowns from Outer Space, live orchestral score performed May 19th, Los Angeles. Be there. Buy the tickets now. The, the yes. most expensive ones are like 100 bucks. You can afford that. If you can yes. get in LA at that oh, point, you can afford that. Quite, Buy the tickets it's, now. It's quite a show. It's going to be a circus before and after and during the performance. <laughs> it's not like you just walk up and there's a, a concert. There's all kinds of great stuff. We've got circus performers performing inside and outside. It's going to be, there's supposed to, I can't reveal it, but there's supposed to be a, a lot of uh, celebrity guests. Well, at least we know there'll be popcorn. There will definitely be popcorn. <laughs> That's for sure. And That's- the hashtag is KKFOS30. Uh, and uh, you can check. Uh, you could, if you do that on a Google search, you'll you'll find the event page and the tickets and everything.
All right. So, until next time, Live and Wired is dead and unplugged. Wait. <laughs>